appreciate all the support that you've ever given us, and go Cog Prime. And I want to make sure you get your trophy here as well, man. MVP, Sino, and it's heavy, man. Make sure you hold on to it for me. MVP, raise it up for him, man. It's just so incredible. I'm so happy. And, uh, you know, I've always wanted to tell my parents that I finally won this tournament. So, Mom, Dad, I finally won Worlds. Feels like I'm in a dream. I haven't woken up yet. Hopefully, the dream never stops. Good morning and happy Sunday, my fans, and welcome back to the final day of the SPL Path to Masters playoffs. We are here in day number four. We've got two sets left for you guys, both of them. Best of fives to determine our seating moving in to the Masters event. We can take a look at the bracket to see how our week has shaken up so far and what has led us to this glorious Sunday morning. It started, all started off with the Gilded Gladiators and a 3-1 over the Ferryman Eldritch Hounds, 3-1 to the Jade Dragons. That bumps the Gladiators then up to face the Leviathans, who fell 3-0, or er, uh, Eldritch Hounds, then fell 3-1 to the Camelot Kings. And then our matchup that will go a little bit later today will be the Leviathans and the Camelot Kings. However, on the lower end of the bracket, Styx Ferryman found a win against the Eldritch Hounds, 3-1, Dragons, 3-1 up over the Gladiators. And now that leads us to our first matchup of today, which will be the Styx Ferryman and the Jade Dragon squaring off once more in another best of five. And as mentioned earlier, we'll be jumping to the Atlantis Vithans and the Camelot Kings on the winner side to close out our Sunday and cap off the Path to Masters playoffs. And it would be a fun day of smite between these two squads out here. Jade Dragons have been showing some strong signs of improvement. Same thing with the Styx Ferryman over the course of this phase. I'm J-Mac. I got Mifflin joining me here on the desk for this best of five between the Ferryman and the Dragons. And I'm excited to see how this matchup can kind of go here, Miff. Yeah, I, I don't know what it is, but something about yesterday's set has infused me with confidence in the Styx Ferryman, J-Mag. something about that last set yesterday as we crest that 7 p.m. threshold. Things getting a little bit wacky. Hopefully, for the Jade Dragons and their fans, they were to clean up a bit of that play. Regardless, still a win up against the Good Gladiators. But the Styx Ferryman have been playing at a different level as of recent. Paul, in particular, has really stepped up his own individual play. Uh, I would say Baskin has stepped up, but I feel like he's just kind of been there. Basking's kind of already kind of been there at that point through. Paul's been playing a lot of different picks over into the mid lane as well. We've seen some new things like the E shell, Morgan Le Fay kind of making its way back, but we've also been seeing some of the standard and classic style of Paul. And speaking of Paul, we actually have him standing by for our pregame interview. That's right, we have Paul standing here, and I do want to actually touch on, on what he had kind of asked about, because I feel like we've gotten two dynamics of Paul so far this week. We got the Hebo that gets a quadric. We'll give you the pentakill, right? It was delayed. He it held was it was close, out. yeah. And then we get the E shell that, that kind of struggled a little bit. I do want to ask, what do you think about just E shell right now and competitive and, and if you can make her work or is that just something you tried out and we're not going to see again? Um, well, her first three abilities, like her basic abilities, are, are really strong. Like mm -hmm. it's like an insane combo. You could just like 100 to zero somebody. Yeah. But uh, the alt is, I think it might be like the worst mage alt in the game. So it's like. She's got insane first three abilities, but the ult's really lacking. So I just wanted to see potentially I could have just like been owning everybody, but yeah. did not work out. And sometimes you got to try it out, right? Double, we were actually just having it. Double Elo moods. Sometimes you have a game that you can spare. I was excited to see her. And like you said, I think the first three abilities, we had very similar sentiments watching it where we were like, man, that ult didn't didn't hit the way I think Paul wanted yeah, it to. Yeah. And then, of course, you get those performances like the Hebo, which I guess kind of brings us to today. Dardes that you're playing up against has a much, I don't even want to say wider god pool. You both have really wide god pools, but they're very different, right? Dardes is going to play things like the Hera. You'll play whatever your team throws at you, and you're going to make it look good no matter what. So what kind of things do you do preparing for a matchup where he's going to be playing a lot of unconventional god picks? Um, I, I don't really... I mean, you just keep an eye on it. You know, maybe yeah. you could like bottom two ban it or whatever. But uh, I know I respect it a lot. You know, like the innovation, like the blink Kronos and the Hera. I think it's a uh, it's a really interesting player. I respect it a lot. It's always spicier, right? It gives a little 100%. bit of variety into the mid lane. And so watching this um, this matchup, right? Third, fourth seed going into Masters can change the bracket you're going up against. A little bit of money on the line. What is the team's mentality going into today? What are your goals and and, and what do you hope to accomplish? 
Uh, well, we just want to win because we lost to the uh, Glads. And I actually thought the Glads played pr pretty well, yeah. but I think a lot of it was us just like dropping the ball hard. So I think we just kind of want to like prove today, I mean, just by winning our this game and since we won yesterday that like we're not like the worst team, you know, like we're, we're actually like decent, you know? <laughs> yeah. And you know what? I feel like that's exactly what this one will do, right? Kind of cement yourselves third seed, make sure that everybody knows that you're still here to play. And of course, I think set things up really wonderfully, at least for us going into Masters, yeah. create some spice for the fans as, out there as well. So good luck in your games, man. Thanks for your time. We'll go back to the desk to break down the Thank match. You. And sometimes that's the beauty of having these kind of double elimination style formats is even if you have maybe a bad game one or a, a bad first day, you can always make yourself a nice little run a little bit later on throughout there, and that's what we're seeing now for really both of these kinds of teams out here. Because remember, the Jade Dragons were able to find some success in their matchup, and now you have the Six Fairmen finding success as well to now kind of have their meets ends here right at the very end of the tournament to see how things go through. Paul, as mentioned, him and Dart is both sharing kind of wide pools of gods to kind of stretch through, but it's kind of on like different ends of the ocean here. You know, you've got more of like the hunter style selections, these more utility kind of picks that you see over from Dardis and you have the more kind of hyper carry-esque style when you think over maybe towards Paul. But I also do want to kind of touch in on Tabaskin because that's a player that we highlighted a lot during their last set for the Six Ferryman. Man got Hercules, what, three or four games of that entire set, looked insane on every single one of them and we kept making the call for when is somebody finally going to take this Hercules away from Baskin? Because it just felt like he was creating so much space for his team. Baskin, in his last six games, has played five of Hercules and one of Guan Yu. There is a similarity, a parallel between those two picks, and it's that their first pick, first band, pretty frequently, right? So somehow, some way, the Styx Ferryman have been able to get Baskin onto just priority selections that have served him incredibly well. I think that, and when you take into account the the, the history of, of Baskin and Woon Young Kim in, in the SBL, which is a very long history. I know it's been a, a couple of gap years since we'd last seen him. Uh, he was widely hailed as the GOAT. If you're an aggro fanboy, and we're in Twitch chat right now, so we absolutely know there's some aggro fanboys out there. He, he has gone on record saying that he thinks Woon Young Kim is one of the best players to have ever touched Smite. Maybe that weighs into the decision-making process and bans. Well, we can't ban him out, so we might as well just let him have whatever it is and try and target someone else. But... If anyone's going to have an answer, I think it would be the Jade Dragons. The Jade Dragons have similarly got some very veteran players on their side. Polar Bear Mike, uh, been in the league for just about as long as Baskin has. The difficulty with the Jade Dragons as of right now seems to be their inability to capitalize on their own success. It's suffering from success, if you would. Often, the Jade Dragons find themselves three, four, five, six thousand gold up at around that 15 to 20 minute mark. And... I know gold means a little bit less than it once did in, in years of past because of the comeback mechanics that have been introduced here in year 10. But even being able to establish a lead that large is something that other teams have struggled to do, unless you're the only Warriors. They do it every time. But the Jade Dragons have similarly been able to see that success throughout the early. It's transitioning into objectives. It's grouping up as five. It's pushing down towers. It's grouping on Phoenix. That seems to be where the Jade Dragons hit their, hit their wall, their proverbial wall. It's a fine place to have it. Uh, it. Much better to be able to consistently win out in the early game, isn't it? That's the only portion of the game that you always play. That's a direct quote from Polar Bear Mike, by the way. Uh, the only portion of the game that you always get to play is the early, and the Jade Dragons seem to have a decent lock on how they want to approach that. It's just the rest of it that they got to close out. Otherwise, you can look at each one of their individual players and very clearly see why that early game tends to go so well. Lazbra always plays the hyper-aggressive get active at level 3 style pick or Bakasura, which is get active at level 5. The Sir Cat comes to mind. The Thor comes to mind. The Bakasura, uh, of course. And then you look at Polar Bear Mike, and he is a self-purported annoying monster. That's what he wants to do. He wants to be on your green buff and on your purple buff, generating pressure so that Vote is allowed to free farm throughout the early game. You've got Nika, who has been one of the most consistent solo laners in the league for a couple years now, even back on the Oni Warriors, now with the Jade Dragons. Always capable of holding his own. Does not see too many rotations from his own team over towards Soul Lane. So he farms effectively and doesn't necessarily fall down if anybody tries to gank him. The Jade Dragons are pretty decent uh, about jumping onto these neutral objectives. It's just everything past what I've just said. That's all pre-17 minute talk. Past there, it's the Wild West with his team and you never know what you're going to get. Yeah, I mean, even talking about Mike, not just, you know, talking about the consistency of how often you do have to play that early game, which is every single game, but also even saying that his favorite role is being that support. You know, he thinks that the biggest compliment as a support player is when someone says, man, I hate playing against that guy. He is so annoying to go up against. And 
Mike seems to be one of the players in the league that really thrives off that kind of mentality against his opposition. That's why we see maybe some of the more – we do see a lot of the standard meta because you do need to play some of the top picks, but maybe that's why we also see some of the stranger things sometimes come out of him, things that you get into a game and you're like, man, I don't like playing against this guy. Well, Mike says, well, okay, I'm going to try and throw that one in a sport role, you know, see if it still ends up sticking there. The mate support seemed to have fallen a little bit out of Mike out of Mike's hands, at least at the very beginning of the tournament. We were seeing a lot of things like the Hell, the Aphrodite. We look in the matchups as at least as of yesterday as we jump into the picks advance here for game number one against the Dragons. But we look back at what Mike has been playing just yesterday. Yamoja, Kabrakin, Nox, and Horus. Only one of those as a mage support and only one of those which has been seeing at least maybe greater success of the mage supports as of recent. That being that Nox selection. So I like what we've been seeing out of Mike in the switch to kind of moving back to some of the more traditional style of support picks. The ones that have been working out really well for him. And as we jump into at least the first wave of bans, Sirket and Yamoja going to be banned out by the Styx Ferryman, taking a shot at PBM on that Yamoja selection, and a Marti Cross to round things out. Jade Dragons will ban away the Vamana, which was a pain in everybody's side just yesterday in, in the prior set for the Dragons. And then the Baba Yaga joins there. Definitely a pick to take away from Paul more than anybody else, because it feels like there's just something about Paul's Baba that really hurts more in the league than anybody else. No matter if everybody's building the exact same build, it feels like Slight bit of Paul pass and pops in with that god. Yeah, just one that he's very comfortable on. It feels like Paul, more than anyone else, really understands how to utilize that ultimate. Uses it for peel, uses it for chase down, but he's always using it well. And, and so I think it's always a treat when we get an opportunity to watch him play the Baba Yaga. Similarly, I think it's always a treat when we get to watch him play the Hell. Put your hands together and pray that it is going to be Paul on that Hell, because you do not want to see it in support. At least I don't, personally. I uh, can't speak for the rest of uh, everybody else on the planet, but... When Paul's piloting that pick, it is high damage, it's high pressure, generally has phenomenal scaling into the late game, will either go towards utility or full damage depending on the pace of the game, so it's adaptability out of mid. Uh, and then you've got a standard cleanse. The reason I don't want to see it in support is the weakness of lacking an in initiation. We've seen teams really struggle when they don't have a traditional guardian or warrior or someone that could start your fight consistently, uh, and Hell's not exactly that. So it could be, but I would prefer to see it in mid. Justice. Though to go alongside that Hell, Naja and Thor. Now for the Styx Fair, or sorry, Tier, not Thor, Tier, the other Norse god. Here for the Styx Fair. I mean, Jade Dragons, they'll take Guan Yu and Hachiman. So for at least for Baskin, we'll see his first new god in the last at least six game on the Styx Fairman with that Tier selection. Meanwhile, Jade Dragons, the Guan Yu, Hachiman, and now Hebo to round out their top three. So you've got your carries for your backline on this Hachiman, on this Hebo, though, could possibly still be. And I just say this because we've seen it from the Jade Dragons in the past that maybe this Hajiman could flex over towards mid. We have seen Dardas take it there. Could be setting up for maybe a double hunter composition, but we'll have to see at least how the remainder of the draft goes through here. But do you like, so far, at least for the Styx Ferryman along this hell, if this is a hell support, do you like the Naja and the Tier to go alongside it as kind of maybe that front line? Uh, it is good. Tier, with his most recent buff, has kind of pushed him over that edge where I think he can be your standard initiator more often than not. Whereas previously it was, okay, I got a Lawbringer to the back line and then line up my Fearless. And also the Fearless needs to be going the right direction or they're just not going to beads it. Uh, or they will beads and I got one guy's beads and it cost me everything, right? So now having defensive stance stuns, when you're in the defensive stance on tier and utilize the ultimate, everyone afflicted by your damage is also afflicted by a one second stun. That is enough. Disruption, it's massive AoE. Uh, and it's consistent on initiation. Really good on Phoenix Dive, really good in Fire Giant fights. And, and then it also makes it much easier for you to line up that Fearless and make sure it is going the right direction. It almost reminds me, in execution, this is speaking directly to the OG players out there, to the old Blink Fist of the Gods tier meta. I'm going to Blink in, I'm going to stun you with Fist of the Gods, and I can reposition myself to make sure it works. Now he's got that hard baked into the kit, essentially, just tied to an ultimate cooldown. Uh, and then, of course, all the strengths that tier had previously still there. Very much uh, self-sustaining in that back line. Very much so uh, able to hold his own in lane. Can either be a dive or backline peeler if he needs. Adaptable in that sense. And allowed to build a little more damage. Uh, we know that Baskin in particular ha has been liking some of the more damage in his builds. We've seen some Frostbound Hammers from him. Some Arendites. Tier's got defense hard baked in the kit. So why not toss one power item into your build? As the bands go through, at least yesterday against the Sticks Ferryman, there's a lot of focus towards Aurora. Things like the Ares, Ganesh, we're typically in those bottom two. This time it will still be the Ganesh, but instead a Shibalanke ban 
alongside it for the Jade Dragon. Stick Fairman will ban away the Terra and the Bakasura. They maybe try and give this Naja a little bit of an easier time. So some of those top junglers now taken out with earlier on the Circuit being banned away. Now the Baka to go alongside that one. So for Stick Fairman, we'll get to see if this Hell is going to Paul or if this one's going to be going over towards Aurora. It seems the Jade Dragons may not be fully convinced themselves by taking that Ganesh ban away. Maui locked in. That's going to confirm that this hell is going to Paul. And what does Cyclone Spin want to go for with the Shibalanke that he's been so happy with going towards in the past? Will now instead be replaced by a ROM. So now the six Fairymen have completely shored up all concerns with initiation. Between Naja, Tyr, and Maui, you've got it in spades. My concern now is the consistent damage output and ability to kill confirm with this Styx Ferryman composition. If Paul feels like there's enough pressure on the Jade Dragons that he needs to go in towards a little bit of utility, which he often has. We've seen a lot of regrowth from Paul. We've seen Breastplate of Valor in the past, some more defensive oriented items. Well, Hell's gonna start lacking for damage. It's not the standard long range burst that we see from the majority of the mage column. Uh, Maui's not exactly the highest damage pick in the game. Naja is good at dealing with that front line, but it's more so about the facilitation and displacement. Uh, tier in that exact same column. So I think this is a game that is really, really going to be riding on Cyclone Spin and his performance. This ROM needs to be in great position to land autos on priority targets consistently. The ultimate shots need to be landing to secure these kills. And that is a lot of weight to put on a player, but Cyclone Spin, uh, one of the best to have ever done it. So certainly capable, I think. Whereas the J Dragons on the other side, they're not going to be lacking for kill confirmation. Hebo's got it in spades. I. Uh, Water Spout, Crushing Wave, good luck surviving just that. And if you did, Water Cannon on the tail end. Uh, Hachiman, good ranged burst. Uh, has really good poke potential. Great boxing in lane. And, and then the initiation, similarly very strong. Perhaps a bit weaker than the initiation of the Styx Ferryman. You've only got the Guan Yu and the Horus to, to start off your fights. Whereas Maui, Tyr, and Naja can do it for the Styx Ferryman. But the, the main thing that I'm going to be watching this game is Lazbra's positioning in the late game 5-on-5. Five if if the J Dragons have identified a similar weakness that I have, which is the ability to actually deal kill damage, if Lazbra can close gap on this Nemesis to the ROM and just prevent ROM from stepping up or make Cyclone skin, uh, Spin concerned about his ability to survive the fight, he's missing a few more auto attacks, maybe he isn't following up on all that CC the Styx Fairman have lined up for themselves, and it will open the door for the rest of the J Dragons. And it's just a very good matchup for, for Nemesis. There's really no answer. Uh, to the shield for Rom. Now, maybe speaking on the Nemesis and kind of going back to what you were talking about with Paul and Mattel traditionally building one to two kind of defensive items, making themselves a little bit tankier, a little bit more sustain oriented here. Do you like the Nemesis as a selection? That way maybe he can dive on, uh, at least onto this hell, maybe seal some of those protections, make it a little bit easier for him to find picks on towards Paul. <sighs> yes and no. It, it, it's timing dependent, of course, but Hell is actually uniquely suited to deal with the dive of Nemesis in that it's just slows, right? It's just slows and you've got to cleanse and enhance movement speed for yourself. Wait for slice and dice, wait for the ultimate, cleanse, heal, walk away. It, it's pretty simple. It's a difficult situation at times, but if you're able to force the cleanse a little bit earlier, then all of a sudden the Nemesis will have her opportunities. I, I, I think it is going to be pretty often though that we see Paul dropping that on himself just to immune the plethora of slows here from the from the Jade Dragons. It's not just the Nemesis. It's the Hebo. It's the Hachiman. It's the Guan Yu. Might just be a Wing Blade game. Well, well, let's see exactly how Paul's build kind of shakes out here. Will he go much more defensive style? Will he get a little bit more offense in the kin? Well, time will tell as the game does go through. Remember, third place on the line for both of these two teams and a best of five in order to determine that. So who's going to start off on the right foot? Will it be the six ferrymen? Will it be the dra dragons? Let's jump in out into game number one with Gore and Trelly. Thanks, J-Mac and Mifflin. It's game one, as J-Mac mentioned. It's Gore and Trelly. Of course, it's going to be Doug. As we watch, Trelly, I, and, and maybe it was just because I said it yesterday, I really like the idea of game one here and a best of five being the tone setter. Kind of lets you get the vibe check for what the teams are going to be going for. Ooh, look and at an that. And an absolute 50-50 on the Twitch poll. Wow. That's the first time I've seen a, an, an exact tie. And that tells me either A. A. We don't know based on picks and bets. I've got a feeling most people in Twitch chat just pick. And then they don't they don't look into picks and bands. They don't think about you know the the composition. They just vote, and that's fine. I think you've got a third that pay attention to the picks. Okay. A third that vote for their favorite team. Yeah. And a third that don't know either, and they're just voting. 
<laughs> you know what? That, <laughs> that seems like a good split. That, that checks out. And if that's the case, I don't know. If I had to I vote, you, chat. if I had to vote with zero bias, just looking at the compositions, I think I would lean towards the J Dragons, just because I like the late game carry potential of Lazbra on the Nem, the Hebo, yeah. Dardes is piloting, and of course, vote getting one of the best ADCs in the game. Whereas if you look on the other side, you know, Sino on Naja is great, but he's not playing the hard carry. He's more set, playing the set up for Paul. Cyclone's going to take a while to get online with this yeah. Rama. But you do have to give, number one, Paul on Hell a big boost. And, of course, Baskin on this tier, I think, has been playing lights out on pretty much every pick that he's been able to grab. So it's not black and white. It's yeah. not just, oh, J-Dragons, I think, have a better comp, so they just win. That's not how it works. But I do like the fact that the, yeah. the chat's completely split. And I have to, to throw out there, at least for me, that it's easy to forget because of the last game that we watched last night of the Dragons, how well performing they were in the first three that they were playing. A lot of better smite being played, I think, in comparison. And sometimes oh. it changes a lot. Paul, chest off the mark. Good knockups right now from Dardes. And Lasper's getting a lot of damage out there onto Sino. Has to play carefully here. Goes for the dash forward. Sash, not going to connect, not going to have the stun, but the damage from Paul is still there. It's a fight for first blood. Who's going to find it first? Lasper gets it. The shield is good. And Paul trying to return oh, it. Please, no even shot. better. Lasbra gets in, gets the kill, and gets out. Okay. Paul whiffed the kill on a Dardes. And Sino whiffed that Sash that definitely would have netted a kill on the Lasbra. That's an unfortunate start to the game here for the Sticks Freeman, or a very fortunate start to the game if you're the Jade Dragons. Getting first blood there from Lazarus, blinking away at the last second, and the, the clutch level three to put his point into that shield to make sure that Paul couldn't get the kill. And that's going to be an absolutely great start. The Nemesis will finish that Golden Blade even sooner. And you just get to quick farm, Sino going down. He's going to have a very hard time not only matching the farm of Lazarus, not only matching the pace of Lazarus, Imagine the damage output. This nemesis is going to be a threat now that the game continues. And I'm thinking trying to find Sino in the jungle at level 5 could be a smart call. I mean, you should be winning that 1v1, especially if you hit ult. And, of course, the wind fire wheels isn't even available. Could be a good idea just to look around right lane right when those blue buffs are spawning in. And that is where the junglers are headed now. But it looks like Lazarus is more focused on the back camps. And Sino's probably not looking to invade. I mean, again, you fall down early. The Naja doesn't do too much damage until you get access to that ultimate. And that's been really one of the big pivotal moments, I think, with this Naja over the last few days that we've been watching for Sino. Is getting that, that true setup. Although normally, and, and you know, maybe this is just because my brain, again, years and years and years of playing and watching Smite, I see Naja, I think, who's the big follow-up, and I don't see necessarily an immediate big follow-up, but you don't need that all the time. As we've seen the last few days, I mean, the last few days you've not had, like, a Ra or a Scylla or a Kukul Khan who's like, all right, I'm going to slam them with a thousand damage the minute they hit the ground. You've got your Hells, you've got your your E-Shells, your, well, admittedly, Hebo falls into the proper category of Burst. And so definitely still able to work pretty well. Do you think this first blood is going to make the dra or not the dragons, the ferrymen, rethink their aggression, though? Like early on, does it cause them enough distress that they now have to prolong their engagements? Or, or does it just line up now that Sino's is five? Cool, he's got ult, he can fight. He certainly can, but I, I tend to agree with you that when I see Naja, the, the burst ultimate follow-up is... The best case scenario, because if yeah. it's not available, what's going to happen is, oh, Naja takes someone up, and Nika says, hey, I'm going to make sure that you can't follow up. Like, I'm going to go on to Paul, I'm going to use the horse, I'm going to stun him. He can't just be the, the big damage at the at the bottom. Same thing with Cyclone Spin. Trying to CC these targets to make sure they can't follow up with this massive ultimate is usually the call. And that makes Naja's job a lot harder, because if you're the one who has to do all of the damage before they land, you know, you, that's usually not going to end up very well. Uh, for your squad. Uh, so I think they, they still have the ability to get active, of course, as long as you are taking smart fights and, and sort of making sure you're waiting the deck in your favor. You know, like, oh, it's a 2v3. Okay, we can go in here. Oh, they, they, someone just back. Let's try and fight. Those sort of things are always going to be possible here for the ferryman. But like I said, Lazarus is going to be a, a growing threat. He should be able to outfarm Sino. Of course, he actually has fallen behind a bit. Probably just standing around looking for ganks. Just by nature of how quickly Sino's been able to farm. He went for the Jotuns, which means he's got more cooldown, more abilities to spam, etc. But this Nemesis still could be in a big impact.
depending on where Lazbert decides to get active. This left side of the map doesn't seem too easy. Both Rama and the Hachiman, very safe in the current meta. They can just sit back wherever they want. Alt used by Aurora for the shield buff, gets the shield buff, and he's Maui. So move speed, and specifically his leap should be coming up there. The cooldown to get him out of there. Got maybe a little closer than Aurora was anticipating. But he does manage to stay alive, Trelly, and you had mentioned it, the Rom and the Hachi, very, very safe. I think that assuming you've got either your cooldowns up for the Maui or someone nearby for the Horus, you're pretty much meeting the same fate, right? It's very difficult to burn through the tanks. They both have decent disengage for a lot of these fights. Yeah, they certainly do. Horus in particular can just be so slippery. PBM can play as aggressive as he wants as long as he has someone nearby or that ultimate. Usually a get-out-of-jail-free card, uh, assuming that they're close enough that he can use that dash. But slow pace so far. A little bit of a scrap over the shield, but Roran just wanted to drop the ultimate and make sure that he could get out safely. And that has been pretty much it. I mean, it was just the, the, the level 2 translating into a level 3 fight in mid lane, where Lazaro was able to pull ahead and get first blood. But that's been equalized. I mean, this is a relatively even game going into the 6-minute mark. And I don't think other, either team has any overwhelming ability to pull objectives, of course, with Lazbra as an auto attack, Assassin, and Hebo in the back. That's going to be a little bit more burn, a little bit more confirmed, but of course Najah's got the crits, and Paul's going to provide a good bit of burst damage as well. And oh man, <laughs> not only did Paul start Divine, that's fine. That's, that's run of the mill. You're worried about anti-heal. He's going to go Prophetic Cloak on the hell. This isn't the, 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 the Baba Yaga, oh, I can stack it up for free. This is, hey, I want to be as tanky as possible. Probably a sickle, probably a breastplate of regrowth. If he goes three tank items, I'll be baffled, but it looks like he's setting up to try and go something like that. Yeah, at least on the, the he's he's at the, the fork in the road where he can get one tank item and continue some damage or get one tank item and continue on tank items. So we'll watch. Seven, min uh, seven minutes in, wow. And like you said, pace after that first blood hasn't been too crazy. And maybe important, though, the Dragons, about 100 gold right now in their favor, which that changes, uh, I mean, significantly wave to wave. So the first blood bounty that they got earlier, taken away and farmed up by the Ferryman experiments, or exper experiments, experience, virtually even. But the pressure on the mid tower is absolutely insane. I mean, every other tower is is virtually untouched. A little bit of poke onto the tier one and left. Bastion's still standing for the side lanes and for the ferryman in mid. Yet for the dragons, Dardes has been locked under his tower and it is just a few hits away from falling. And yesterday we saw in some of the dragons games, pretty late tier ones to make a big difference. Right now, though, it feels like pressure has been the name of the game in mid. And though we haven't gotten to see that explosive play yet, right? That Naja sash in, ult up, drop down into ideally someone killing the person dead. Uh, we're still getting, I think, a lot of just push from the ferryman. Constant discomfort onto the Hebo to make sure that he can't play the way he wants. Yep. Unfortunately for Dardes, it takes a bit for Hebo to actually be able to one-shot the archers and and of course the melee's even longer. And because of that, Paul can heal up the wave, send it under tower, look. and look for pressure. And that's sort of been what, he, what he's been going for, is hey, maybe I can knock down this, this tier one. And Dart is like, bro, I don't, you already outrange me. You've got Aegis, you're gonna build tanky. Can we just like sit here and farm and then, you know, let each other go? And Paul said, nope, I'm going to make <laughs> nope. sure I get as much pressure as possible in the early game. Sino is looking towards mid, maybe able to pull a beads here. And it looks like, yes, Dart has, Panic Beads did not want to take that extra damage, didn't want to risk the wind fire wheels, and now there's a giant target on his head that says, I can be ulted. If, if Sino finds another Sash, maybe we're looking towards a kill opportunity. And if they keep getting the pressure that they've got here, if they can get that tier one, it becomes a much easier opportunity. Roars here, goes for the landfall, Ooh. just off the mark of pulling Dardes back, and then some good peel from Aurora ensures that there's no hook follow-up. Tier 1 still seems to be a little bit of the goal. Lazbra is in the jungle nearby, but I don't know that they want this 3v3. Vexano seems like he wants to take the fight to the Nemesis. And Trelly 
We're soon going to have a little bit more to fight over for these two teams. A lot of mid-camp conversation. The farm is still pretty much neck and neck, about a hundred, little over a hundred gold separating the teams. Pyromancer is going to be joining the fray soon. Relatively easy to burn down. Gold Fury is still available over on the left-hand side. You had kind of mentioned it, though, that... You know, the Dragons have a comp that could get hands-on a little earlier if they wanted, but they don't have to. Both of these teams go great late-game Cyclone. Throwing some shots, taking some shots. Walks away a little worse for wear. Lasper's in the jungle as well, so maybe needs to play carefully over the next couple of minutes. Might not be able to help Aurora if things go wrong. Doesn't even need the help. Shield buff goes the way of the Ferryman. Yep, but the tower does drop. Sino sashed in, trying to find the ult on Adardas, and it's going to take some damage here. Crushing wave wow. and the water hand should be enough, but he doesn't hit. Lazbra walks through to confirm that kill. Tier 1 tower for the kill on the Sino. Seems fine for now. Looks like the Jade Dragons are trying to retreat. I was going to say, Cyclone got back to base and said, hey, I got a Tier 2 balance blade over Vote, who had not backed at all. I'm going to go in, I'm going to get aggressive. Immediately dashes in and Vote says... Okay, I'll dash back. I, you think I care? I'm going to try and fight this. Cyclone has to panic. He has to beads. And Vote ults gets him down to like 30% HP. And that's going to be the end of that scrap. But now the Jade Dragons group towards the Gold Fury. And unless Cyclone comes in with some snipes, it looks like it's relatively free. Yeah, burning already. Halfway down. Cyclone going to be channeling his back for a moment there. Sino was back towards the speed buff. So Gold Fury plus another kill for the Dragons. And Charlie, they're going to start marching their way into a more confident lead, but most of the time it's, it's actually just stripping away what had slowly started amassing for the ferryman. The ferryman start up the pyromancer. And as we can see, there's not a dragon in sight. So a lot of that lead they just stripped back in their favor. Shimmy's back over towards the ferryman. Tier 1 on left. Helps balance things out. Cyclone's been going in for the 1v2. Has Sino coming up. Goes into the sky. Snipes are good. But they're going to have to look for damage onto Mike. Need to get it before the ult channels. Finds the last shot. Gets the kill. Puts the ferryman on the board. Yep. Jade Dragons get aggressive for that tower. Great play. But then sticking around after. That's really what came back to bite him. The very least, Vogue gets out of trouble. But Mike was not able to get to the sky. Did not get that shield. And ends up falling. Giving that kill over to Cyclone Spin. Maybe a tier 1 tower of their own here for the ferryman. Does seem like they'll be able to grab it. By the way... I, I do see what Paul's going for here. He didn't end up building the cloak. That spirit rope. He goes for the spirit rope into a breastplate. Oh, first of all, I hate it. Second of all, it seems like he's worried about Dardes knock up into death. Wants that extra mitigation because of the hard CC, and this will help him out. He started Aegis anyway, so it wasn't too safe as is, just trying to avoid the, the crushing wave. The Sibo could be a threat as the game continues. But he's more focused on sustain. I do think the Sticks Ferryman are going to be lacking damage for a bit. But as we've seen, if you can get to late, late game, get a red buff, get some power pots, doesn't matter if you go for a, a regrowth and a spirit rub. You should have the proc items, a soul reaver, something like that later on that will make sure that you still do a decent bit of damage as the game continues. Not rivaling that of Dardes, but that was never Paul's plan to begin with. Yeah, I think if you're if you're locking in a hell to rival a... Well, I guess they locked it in first. If you're playing hell thinking you're going to match Ebo's damage ever... Good luck to you. I mean, maybe grand scheme overall in the game, but like in the middle of a team fight, th that dude's going to do it all at once. And sometimes it's just going to hurt too much. That's why you got to play carefully around him. Or, in Aurora's case, just be absurdly tanky. And unless Dardas is going to commit the ult, know that you're pretty much fine. Landscape of the map has been shaking a little bit. And, and admittedly, I have to, to, to point out the farming of the ferryman. They have lost... Two important kills. Both have been onto the junglers, yet Sino's still at the same level. Experience is in their favor. Gold is still in their favor. Sino takes a crushing wave to the face, though, and that might change things up. Dardes needs some cooldowns. Waterhands good. Sash is there, but I don't know if you're going to get what you want. Aurora tries to get out. Can't escape Dardes with the double. Paul coming around. Baskin's here, and he gets a great fearless onto the Hebo. Snipes start to ring true. Hit onto Vote. Immediate ult in, but no. Mike pulls him out just in time. They lose Dardes, but they pick up two, and the rest get to run away scot-free. There's no tower here. I don't know how Scott free it's going to be. Someone's going to have to peel Paul. He's got the movement speed, and it looks like just the standing there was enough to make sure Paul doesn't chase that one down. Beautiful ultimate there from Mike to make sure the team gets out of trouble. But also, got to hand it to Baskin. Makes the clutch rotation. Says, hey, wait, didn't that Hebo that's wrecking my team just beads? Blinks in and makes sure to serve up Dardes on a plate. 
Now that's that's a level 16 tier. I gotta say, I've really been enjoying the, the transcendence builds from some of these warriors. You slot in a little bit of damage. You're a little bit less tanky, sure, but at this moment, there's not enough DPS online from the carries to really threaten you. And now because you've got that transcendence, you become... You could just 100 to 0 someone with your tier combo. And that's what Baskin's looking for. He steps up and says, hey, whoever's got beads down is going to be in trouble. And now Darius has to watch his positioning for the next 90 seconds or so. He still has Blink down for a minute, and those beads for another 90 seconds. Sebo's going to have to stay pretty far back. Because he's got a lot of CC to worry about on the side of the ferryman. Not to mention, Sino could look for the wind fire wheels. And no matter how tanky you are, no matter how much damage you can do, if you're getting taken up as a Hebo, you're probably dying on impact. Always the ever-present threat, right? Sino's not sure. Uh, something to be worried about. The good fights from the dragons have managed to keep things close here. Crushing Wave still connects on to Sino there. In mid, PBM chasing it down. Windfire Wheels used defensively. Lasbur dives under the tower, gets a fifth kill for the Dragons. But now he needs to get out of there. Damage is too good. Hook even better from Aurora. Keeps Lasbur engaged, but Paul, he's missing. Can't miss that one. Nice big circle, gets the kill, and trades this one out one for one, jungle for jungle. The Oni Fury's up, and it looks like the Jade Dragons are grouped towards it. Sino's gone, Lazbra's gone, and the burst probably still in favor of the Jade Dragon. Stardust just does a lot of roar, pulling in just to try and get them off the Fury. And it seems like that's a slow burn, but they're going to get right back on it. Baskin has to ult in, that's his only play, he doesn't have it. There's going to be the Frenzy Ferryman, get the Pyro, Dragons get the Fury. But now can they pick up some kills afterward? Mike's going to be an easy pickup. Baskin's low, has to dash away. Vote jumps in. Might be problematic for him. Up down from Baskin. Gets a little extra damage, but the carries aren't there. Paul just a little shy on his damage. Can't find Vote. Good sash from Sino, but it's not enough to save a roar. Nika caught out, locked down, and no escape. Means a kill for Cyclone Spin. Objective for objective. Kills for kills. Blows for blows. And Charlie, at the end of it, we're still even. Yeah, two for two. All, the, all, all that happens, you see, trading the Fury for the Pyromancer, and the gold looks exactly even. I mean, at this point, Cyclone Spin's got a Runic Bomb, I suppose. That's, that's the big difference maker. You've got no better map control. I think that that fight starts off just fine. Last press to dive deep. Unfortunately, Sino whiffs the Sash. Darda still lands the Crushing Wave, so this Naja says, okay, I gotta leave. Is not able to get away. But Lazbra has to dive so deep to confirm that kill that Aurora says, hey, I'm going to CC chain you. Make sure that Paul's able to confirm this kill. Get his first of the game. And then the Jade Dragon said, hey, jungle for jungle. We're still feeling confident. We're going to go in for the Fury. And they should. They were able to pull it. All the while, Cyclone spins solos out. The Pyromancer grabs the bomb, comes through with some snipes. And, of course, Nika overextends just trying to make sure that his team was able to get out. And I think Baskin... With this build, the Transcendence of Stone of Binding finally finished up. He did a lot of damage on his way out there. Uh, the, the, this tier is still an ever-present threat, especially towards the squishier characters on the side of the dragon. Tebo, I mean, Lazbra even does not appreciate his shield getting broken three different ways by the tier. And, of course, Vote hasn't died yet, but wants to try and avoid Baskin if possible. Roar? It's a pull on the mic. I don't think... They had many options there. Good dash from Mike gets him out of there. 18 minutes in. I mean, this amount of gold, Shelly, we're, we're starting to enter the territory where it's it's who can flex a fire giant into a better fight at this point. Plus the Runic Bomb, of all people that have it, and it makes sense because he's the one who, uh, he soloed it, right? He was the only one over there. But Runic Bomb sitting there for Cyclone Spin. Not a choice we typically see. The carry is locking it in. A roar as well, eating a little bit of poke. So the fights and the want to fight is still there. 12 kills on the board, 19 minutes in. But I don't. it doesn't feel like either of them, I mean, maybe the Dragons, just because they have the Hebo ult, really want to, to move towards a, a fire yet. It feels like the map state, the game state, it rewards you for playing in lane still right now. Yep, that has been the call. And Gore, I want to ask you a question. Okay. I don't, I don't know if you I saw answer. that. Baskin ulted onto the cooldown buff. Yeah. Given his build, and he was in his damage stance, how much do you think his ult did to the cooldown buff? Damage-wise? Yes. Oh. It's more than you think. That's I what thought I'm you were going to ask about the cooldown because it's up again. No, that, that's, that's, that's great too. But his 
Ult did 817 damage. That's insane. That's ridiculous. Like, he d it does so much damage, though, especially with this build. I mean, I want to see Baskin ult onto carries because of how much I just saw that buff take. And, of course, it's a little bit different. Of course, in this case, Dardis is going to be taken pretty close to that amount. He's just full damage. But I just, I just want to see Baskin go in aggressively because of how much he did. Well, he's going in aggressively. Unfortunately for him, it's that, not that enough guy's to lock tanky. down Nika. Yeah, that guy's going to laugh at any of the damage. Plus, you CC immune, so even if you're in the guard stance, no CC coming from him. But it is enough to at least TKO Nika for a little bit. Setting up around presumably the Pyromancer here. Get another small advantage going towards the Ferryman. They've been favoring this. I mean, they've lost both Furies, gotten all three Pyros, two bombs in their inventory. And Charlie, they're just going to run straight across the map over to the Gold Fury. <laughs> I mean, the Dragons have the option to go for Fire. It doesn't seem like that's what they want, though. They are grouping towards the Fury themselves. And yeah, with Bastion starting it up. Burst still in favor of Dardes. He has Blink. He has Crushing Wave. Will he go for it, though? Doesn't even need to. Just Water Spouts from wow. a distance. And now it's whether or not they can get away with the fight. That's a great landfall to separate things up. Baskin's going to be in a little bit of trouble. Cyclone Spin is just burned down. Sino follows. A great crushing wave from Dardes and great autos from Vote. You get both objectives, but you lose two heavy hitters for the Ferryman. And now the Dragon's going to replicate the movement just mirrored. Runs straight across the mid lane over towards the Fire Giant. I cannot believe Darda stole that. Not even the Water Spout. It was the Divine Ruin proc after the Water Spout. 71 damage is the difference maker there. So you lose the Fury. You may lose Fire Giant if this goes the way the Jade Dragons want. They don't have Crushing Wave. Paul is still relatively tanky here. He can try and make this fight annoying. And look at Baskin, Baskin with the wraparound. He's in the right position. Nika zoning out Paul. Should be good enough to get him there. Cleanse is nice. The damage seems to be a little better. Baskin goes up, down, CC's good. They're stalling out the Fire Giant, but they're losing a lot of their health bars in the process. Baskin goes down, thanks to vote. Dardes kills off Paul and Aurora trying to stay alive. Fire still low, and they have bought respawn time. Vote potentially able to come over, snipe it away. Not going to be the option. Sino's over at speed buff. Fire Giant, 22 and a half in, goes over to the Dragons with a convincing fight. Yeah, Lasper has been doing a great job getting to the back line. Dardes has been an absolute menace on this Hebo. I mean, he died once, but that's pretty much it. It seems like he's free casting as far as I'm concerned. Those crushing waves aren't even the, the real deal breaker. It's just the spam of cooldowns. Mike is going to ult his team under Phoenix. No one is even close. I mean, the Cyclone's been split pushing. Sino's at a speed buff. That Phoenix is going to drop for absolute free all the while. Lasper's still pushing up right. They are controlling this map so well. The J Dragons, who in my opinion, have been having a lot of problems doing exactly this, controlling the map, look at their siege, getting Phoenixes down. In a swift three minute play, steal away a Primal, or a regular Gold Fury, grab the Fire Giant, get a Phoenix and two tier two towers, and head on back to base cleanly. And finally, it's been so long in this game, we have a team with a lead, and a significant lead at that, right? 7,000 gold, 7,000 experience, still looking for some level 20s, if you are the ferryman. Meanwhile, you got four of them standing on the other side. Nice little level lead there for Mike. And like you said, Trelly, they showcase something that we've all been asking for. We just wanted to see better sieges. And they had some clean ones yesterday in their last set. They also had some not, some clean, not so clean ones. But getting that Phoenix, breaking the base, I would argue even more importantly, punishing Sino constantly throughout yep. this game. He's 0-5. and five. It has just been enough to set them apart and maybe change up some of the conversation after the regular season. Yeah, unfortunately, Sino has been trying to be the main initiator of his team. And that becomes a big issue when the beads aren't already down. If they are, you go in, you get the ult easy. What's been happening a lot is I'll go in, I'll ult out because I'm scared they don't, they're going to beads and I just die. And then Lazarus is still able to chase you down. He's got Erendite. He's got Golden Blade. He has so much movement speed. It doesn't matter that you have Wing Blade. Lazarus is still faster than you. So unfortunately for Sino, just has not been safe and has not been able to find that engage. Maybe if Baskin goes in first, then Sino could go in after. But that has not been the play. Sino has been the sacrificial lamb here for his team. And unfortunately, Paul's been hitting like a wet noodle because he went two tank items in a row. It's just Soul Reaver procs. That's, all, that's essentially all he has. Mike seems to be ulting to mid lane. Yeah, he called it off. It seemed like he wanted to go all the way over to right. Over to right. 
He's going to step forward, but no one came through, and Tardes isn't going to get this Phoenix. So not the best call, but it did split up the Styx Ferryman at the very least. And they only have 20 more seconds. I think that's going to be it. And Jade Dragons are fine with their one bird. They're going to head on back to Pyromancer and get themselves their Runic Bomb. Because, again, the Styx Ferryman, they have two. The Pyromancer has been controlled by the Ferryman relatively easily so far this game. But finally, it looks like PBM is going to pick up one for himself. And we're at the rate, especially map state-wise, and you've got to look towards the Ferryman's inventory because if those bombs aren't used in the next five minutes, you're starting to question what, what they're going to be used for. Could be good around the fire if you're trying to compete with some of the bursts that the dragons have. So maybe that's where we see it used. Meanwhile, on the other side, I mean, you had mentioned Mike picking that up but with one Phoenix already exposed and the way Horus has been played so far. I think that there's a very good chance I know where one of those bombs is going to be going. Fire Giants back in 20 seconds. Ward coverage for the Dragons. Pretty deep in the jungle. Going to catch some rotations out from the Ferryman early. Not a lot of vision around the pit itself. Wards and inventory should manage to make quick work of that. Jolly Relics all up. Ults all up. Items bought. You even got an Emperor's right now if you're Mike. Which indicates to me that he thinks not only are they going to be successful around this fire giant, but able to siege afterward. I was just giggling because you said Trelly Relics. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> a, <laughs> I thought you were. I was like, only my father calls me my full name, Gore. <laughs> <laughs> but in this case, it does seem like the Ferryman want to step up. They want to try and defend. That mid <laughs> that mid Phoenix is going to spawn in here shortly. My full name is not Trilly Relics, by the way. And the Phoenix, or the Fire Giant, is getting relatively low. The Ferryman can't step up here. Yeah, they don't have a lot of options. Dardas even still has his ult. Not seemingly worried about having to use it. Aurora should step forward. Landfall Snipes. is available. Snipes are there. Not enough to get the fire. The fight afterward might still be important. Nika's half health. Damage not fully there. Landfall blocks off one escape route, but he drops the island immediately. Dardes gets picked up, does crushing wave back, gets damage onto Sino, but you lose a lot in the process. Your Hebo gone, and now the chase is on for the ferryman. They have to find the line. They want vote. Vote has ult. Vote chases Lasbra. out of there. Lasbra goes around, picks up Sino, who's stuck around. Kills him. And now that Mid Phoenix is still going to drop. Lasbra in a spot to try and get something. You had mentioned it. Mid Phoenix now gone. Mike, Vote, and their jungler, the only ones here, Nika, in a spot where he can teleport in. And he's going to do so. They want to keep this fight going. Nika has ult, could find some big CC here as they stay grouped up. Only finds a roar, but the chase is immediately on to Paul. They separate the carries from their peel, and they look for a little more. Vote kills off a roar. Nika kills off Cyclone. It's Baskin, and it's Paul, all to defend. But Paul, he's forced to run. Trelly, you mentioned it earlier. The damage isn't there. The healing, it can only go so far. The Aegis puts in work. And he's going to make it back to the fountain. But now the Titan is the target for the Dragons. It's been clean since that Fury Steal. And it's going to remain clean, Baskin, with the two-man Fearless into the fountain. Looks good. It's so low. It feels good. There it is. But it's not enough to win this game. Dragons, kill off the Titan and take the first step forward here in the first set of the day. And that's insane because a fight like that, should never go in favor of the Dragons unless they're so far ahead because Dardes missed the boat, right? And Mike said, hey, I'm ulting everyone out. Let's go. We're yep. leaving. Dardes said, I, I forgot my ticket. He, he just <laughs> did not get on. He gets killed immediately. And Paul says, hey, let's chase them down. We have a hell. I'm going to make sure you're all healthy. So that's what he does. He heals up his whole team. And the Dragons say, hey, if Nika teleports back in, can't we just win this because we're like super far ahead? And they're like, yeah, we definitely can. Lasper goes insane. Solos out Sino before yep. the fight even starts, and then make sure to chase down just about everyone else. Uh, you can make plays like that when you get that far ahead. And there's also that moment where you're like, well, you know what? Crushing wave. Like, I didn't get one shot this time. I can <laughs> stay. I can fight. We can get something done. Oh, I'm dead now. Yep. Lasper just decided to walk up to me. You yep. can't stay around and moments like that. The healing's great, but it's not enough. Baskin does a lot of work towards the end. Uh, but it does not defend the Titan the way it needs to. Dragons take a massive lead, and they take the first game. Find out what this ferryman do to answer back in game two after this. I just want to make you mine. Mine, mine, mine.
Welcome back to the SPL playoffs and game number one of our first survey goes over to the Jade Dragons in a fairly decisive game number one. But as our playoffs come to an end today and we start moving ourselves over towards the Masters event in just a couple of weeks, I want to remind you that you can still pick up your favorite gear for your favorite teams brought to us by our good friends over at Skulls. You can go to shop.highriskstudios.com backslash SPL, pick up t-shirts, jerseys, hoodies, and more to represent your favorite teams in the SPL or just rep the SPL in general. All the new merch brought to us by over at Skulls. They look great, and you can look great and feel great. If you pick up your jerseys, your hoodies, whatever you want to celebrate your favorite teams for the SPL. The Jade Dragons here, Mifflin, game number one, looked really good. First Blood was probably the wildest game of cat and mouse I've seen in a while for a first blood kill. It does go over to the Jade Dragons with a pick for Lazaro. But then Six Fairman able to keep things even for about 15 or so minutes of the game, and it really isn't until we start getting towards these real first kind of objective style of plays around these goal furies that the Dragons are able to kind of break out, give themselves their first big lead. And it was probably some of the most decisive gameplay that we have seen out of the Jade Dragons, not really going back and forth and hesitating on their decisions. They keep going in. They say, we're going to commit to a fight. We're going to commit to a tower. And they're able to push through and win game one. Yeah, not a whole lot of hemming and hawing there from the Jade Dragons. Really liked how quickly they were able to move from, we got this kill, let's go fire. We got fire, let's go for tower. Oh, they tried to defend tower. One guy died. We can get a Phoenix. It was very decisive decision making there from the Jade Dragons. And it was one of the, the primary concerns I had brought up originally on the desk was their ability to transition those early or mid-game leads into concrete map state advantages. And the Jade Dragons execute on that very well. I think it does play in part to, to some of the, the building that we had seen from the Styx Ferryman. Maybe had Paul had a little bit more damage, you might have secured a few of these kills. Felt like the Jade Dragons were able to limp away from these engagements pretty often. Uh, even in spite of the damage numbers looking pretty good for, for Paul and company. Uh, it was long spaced out battles, whereas when the Jade Dragons decided to initiate, they would generally find their pick pretty quickly. Uh, by nature of having Dardas on a hell and all that burst that he, or excuse me, Hebo, uh, and all that burst that he affords to his team. So the Jade Dragons come away with a, a, a strong victory here in game one, but it's a best of five set, Jamek, and adaptations certainly to be here. I wonder if the Styx Ferryman think this one is an execution error or whether or not they, they do want to get a little bit more damage in their composition. We'll have to wait till P's and B's to figure that one out. Otherwise, Jade Dragons. Run it back. I, I liked this draft. I like how they played it, and I'm sure they did too. Yeah, I mean, because again, at least for the ferrymen and for fans of them, it looked good for about the first 12 or so minutes of the game. It was pretty much dead even, even with the first blood going to the Dragons. Ferrymen able to keep that farm game going through, even taking a tier one tower in mid very early before the, the Runic Bomb even became a factor on the map. Because that's typically when we see that first mid lane tower go down as Pyromancer spawns in. We take the Pyro, we take the Runic Bomb, we drop Tier 1 Tower, but it was actually done all just off the merits of Paul on this Hell. So, Six Fairman probably feeling at least pretty good about the early game, maybe some of the late game team fights and the execution, maybe not so much there. So, we'll see if the Six Fairman do make some adaptations as the game goes through. But I got to agree with you, I really like the composition the Jade Dragons brought here. It really felt like this kind of fit each individual player's play style. So, we'll see what holds true here for game number two picks and bands for the Six Fairman and the Jade Dragons now hot and ready to go. Six Fairman will once again take that first pick selection for themselves. We saw a little bit of priority taking out the Circuit, the Emoja, at least out of Six Fairman in that first pick position. It seems that at least with the Emoja on the side of Six Fairman, they're going to continue to ring true with that one. And then the Vamana will stay as a band for the Jade Dragons. You know, I'm trying to figure out where the adaptation would need to be with a Six Fairman composition. And I think it, it, it is not at the fault of any individual player, but I, I think there was dissonance between the selections of Paul and Sino. Sino is a phenomenal Naja player. No one's ever going to say he isn't. He, he's one of the better Najas in the league right now. Uh, certainly very capable of playing that pick. So if you want to go towards that, I would prefer to see more consistent damage out of mid. Someone that's got bursts or, or perhaps ranged artillery to poke out more consistently or secure those kills. But Hell is one of Paul's best and Paul is one of the best Hells in the world bar none blanket statement. So if that's the case and you want to go back towards the hell, put Sino in something that can deal more consistent damage. Just got to get it somewhere. Got to get that kill secure somewhere. Uh, and, and leaving it up to a double defense item, hell out of mid, or just your ADC, I think, very difficult. So we'll see what the changes are going to be. Hell locked in once more for the Styx Ferryman, and I'm not going to argue against it. As far as aiming his abilities and finding opportunities to deal damage and resustaining his team and Maybe some of the best cleanses we had ever seen uh, in that match. A couple of those cleanses were absolutely fight-breaking. 
Uh, had there been more damage on the six Fairman, likely would have won them the engagement. So, I'm not mad about it. I just want to see something different in the rest of the draft. Someone that can, can secure those kills. The Jade Dragons, they just limped out of too many of those team fights for my liking. Just a little more. A little more oomph there, at least in the six Fairman. But an interesting ban that pops through, and one that we see rarely in the ban column, at, at least so far this event, Mifflin, the Hachiman. Banned away about a six Fairman. I mean, if you look over towards Votes God Pool for the last six games, it's been five of them being Hachiman and one Shivalanka game. So, for one of the first times this event, we will actually not see a Hachiman in a game. Alongside that ban is the Hebo. And then it will still be the Vamana Baba Yaga and the Marti Cross band out. So, that does leave the Circuit open yeah, on the table. Guan Sir, or Guan along Morris? with this Guan Yu. So maybe a circuit. It's got to be for it, But instead, no it'll be the front line. Guan Yu Terra is the double locking for the Dragons. Circuit's just so good. And it's like Lazarus bread and butter. And it's also a hell on the other side. Really would have thought it would have been circuit there. Maybe they're calling the bluff of Sino. So, yo, Sino, you got a circuit? Haven't seen it this year. Haven't seen it in a whole long time. Maybe, maybe he does. Maybe he doesn't. Guess we're going to find out pretty quickly, and the answer is that he does no. not. There is no circuit players on the Sticks Ferryman. That is what I have just gleaned from P's and P's as they stand. And it's the Najah Hell once more. Maybe just have Paul build more damage then. But if that's the case, you're really concerned about the dive potential that Jade Dragons and already with their top two. They've got really good dive. Oh, look at that. Another diver. Okay, so we're going to see some defense now uh, stacked up for the Hell, which means that damage question mark that we had had in game one and now probably carrying over here in a game two will remain. Whereas the J Dragons, I mean, as far as execution is concerned, this is largely the same draft. Terra going to play slightly differently to, to Horus in that he can't just displace his entire team and, and shift up the map and make you guess where he's going to siege or whether or not they're going to rotate towards an objective. But otherwise, I mean, it, it's, it's a run it down style draft here. And now you're running it down with 10% damage mitigation and protections and essentially lane wide routes. Feels like this is one the J Dragons uh, are going to have a pretty decent time, at least diving the hell. Maybe, maybe you could look towards a roar pick, uh, a roar's pick, excuse me, uh, for a bit more survivability. The Kepri comes to mind. I know Kepri isn't exactly like bread and butter right now. He's not a standard selection, but it would facilitate Paul to build more damage. And if Paul's got more damage, you've got more kill secure and maybe some more opportunities. Well, it will be. Go on Terra Nemesis, so no Circuit at all. Not banned, not picked this set, which is another rarity from not just this event, but Mind for the blown. phase in general. Seems that neither of teams want to go towards that selection. But as far as bans are concerned, Sticks Fairman focusing out Dardes, the Morgan, and Hera. Banned away there along with the Hebo from earlier on. Still quite a few mage selection, selections open for Dardes to go to, or could even be Hunter if he wants to go that way. But opposite side will be bans over towards the support role. Another Ganesh ban away from Aurora. The only player still playing Ganesh in the league at this point. And then Horus, who somehow made his way down all the way into the second wave of bans. That opens up a Shibalanke now for the Jade Dragons. So Vote said, okay, well, if I can't have the god I played five times in a row, you know, almost five times in a row, why don't I just go ahead and pick the other god of the six teams I've been playing, Shibalanke now for the Jade Dragons to cause a little bit of disruption. Those comms, that blind comes online. And as mentioned, just safe wave clear more than anything up against the opposition. Yeah, and it's that massive damage in the late game. You've got the scaling power from his passives, the branching bolas for boxing potential. Seems like Death Toll's back in the meta, so he's always allowed to cast that branching bola. I'm a pretty big fan of Shibalanke as he stands, and he's also the only hunter in the game, the only god in the game, that can deal damage to structures from outside of their range, thanks to the enhanced auto attack range of Darkest Knights, and in a uh, post-enhanced Fire Giant world. That might just be enough to deal with a Phoenix on its own. So I like what Shibalanke does, and it's a team that has struggled in the past in the Jade Dragons with actually sieging. Shibalanke should ease some of those uh, concerns. Mm, okay. okay. Baron Somni mid. mid. Baron Somni mid. It's okay. Uh -huh, yep. Don't freak out just yet. Yep, yep. Don't freak, out, don't freak out just yet. I'm not freaking out. I'm just fine. I am all calm. Just the, questioning. Uh, in combat healing, there's a lot of healing for That's the Jade Dragons now. So Ankh, probably a pickup for the Six Ferryman. It's not confirmable damage on the ultimate, really, at all. Uh, if you've landed the pool, for the most part, the fight has already gone south because beads or leaps or CC immune ultimates have already been used on the other side. But it is really good poke. It's a little bit of range CC. I'm not exactly seeing what it is about the rest of this draft from the Jade Dragons that's saying, yeah, we want 
we want Baron Somdi. You know, I, I see Guan Yu, Terra, Nemesis, and that's W key run it down. Baron Somdi is going to be trailing behind. Like, guys, I want to deal my damage, but they're running away from us. I don't know what to do. But as far as his ability to hold his own in lane, should be able to match the stain with hell. As good, good self peel to a certain extent. That root really difficult to deal with. The enhanced movement speed. Just not sure that I, I I love it with their draft in particular. Into what the ferryman have got makes sense to me. You know, CC immunity the ultimate. You can deal with the the no escape. Uh, you can self peel up against the Hercules. I, I I get why you play it into what the ferryman have, but not why you play it with what the J Dragons have. Now, talking back about the Six Fairman, one of the complaints that you had from game number one was maybe the lack of follow-up damage from the Naja, you know, Hell, Rom, not necessarily, especially with the way that Paul builds his Hell, not necessarily a whole lot of bursts on the bottom end. So now trade out that Rom for a Cupid, for an Ares, maybe for a Hercules. Do you think that this maybe now allows Sino to be able to continue playing that playstyle, and do you think that it works better for his Naja this time based on the gods that were now drafted kind of in place of maybe... Not necessarily the problematic, but maybe the lacking of damage in game one. Well, there's a little bit of AoE presence from the Cupid, which I think is something you really want to leverage when you have a Naja on your team is AoE damage. Uh, so often, Naja drags someone up into the air, and, and the enemy team has a couple of options. Do we vacate the scene? Is this a lost fight because Naja landed wind fire wheels? Let's go ahead and back up. Uh, or do we surge forward and try and peel for your team? When there is AoE damage alongside Naja, that surge forward option becomes a little bit more iffy. Do we want to run forward into a Fields of Love? Not exactly. Question marks up for both of these squads. Can the Sticks Ferryman bring this back and tie up the set, or can the Jade Dragons put them on match point with a 2-0? Let's jump right into game number two. And it's one I'm excited for, Trelly. Again, a lot of pressure on game twos. The difference between tying it up, pushing us to four. Are the Dragons going to set point very quickly in the early morning? Now, we have been fans in the past of Sino's Naja. We were questioning a little bit when we saw the Hell Naja locked in again. Depending on the build, though, maybe that changes up. Not a 50-50 this time. Last time, Twitch chat couldn't decide. This time, Trelly, they like the dragons a little more. I'm got, I got to figure out what the J dragons are cooking here. So, yeah, I was trying to buy you time. I mean, Dardes, <laughs> Dardes is over here. Yeah. Mike is invading what seems like a blue buff. And that's that's the end. That's what they're cooking. I, I I wanted to talk about the Baron because this is a pick that I've been waiting to catch on. The Baron mid, believe it or not, is a Trelly mid special. Uh, I've done it in ranked many times. It always works. Surprisingly, uh, I've been I've been waiting to see if it would be something that goes through. Mike is just being an annoyance though. Yeah. You can't pull the buffs together. He's, he doesn't have a great chance of stealing this, but he is just making sure that Baskin can't get all the farm in the world. He will be able to confirm that buff. And now everyone's a little bit far behind. No, Mike stole that. Wait, he got it? Mike's got it. What? <laughs> Baskin won't have the blue for a little while. No shot. He With his auto? I mean, and right with... There was confirmed. <laughs> Baskin had better damage. Oh, no. So a catastrophic start over there. Mike, and he's still losing out on, on more XP compared to Aurora, who is now going to put the hurt on to vote. Have to remember, Chains and Flames, a lot of damage in the early game. I'm amazed. I'm I'm flabbergasted. Like, we have numbers over the minions now that tells you, hey, this is how much health they have. You don't have to guess. If you if you know Earthbreaker does 82 damage at level 1, just wait till it says 82, click it, you're done. Unfortunately for Vaskin, Mike had the numbers ran just a little bit better. He was able to confirm that buff. Hercules is just in a terrible spot now. I can tell you right now, with the start that he has went, He's lucky he got Totem, because that is like the only way. You have so little MP5. With a Chalice as well, there's no Monophods. Yeah, this is, is going to be a rough time for the solo lane. I, I can already hear, depending on how the rest of the set goes. Mike, you invaded. <laughs> What's <laughs> up with that? I thought it was dead. Uh, he's going to make it work, man. If Mike can find a way, invades will exist in <laughs> Smite. He yep. loves to play aggressively. And I, I agreed with you. I thought he was just going to be obnoxious, which I think he was to, to the maximum extent. I would argue even if he didn't steal, he was happy with what he did. Yes. Yeah. And it just ended up dialing it up to 200%. He was, he was already happy. Now he's happier. Uh, sets Nika off to a wonderful start. Experience-wise, they're not too far behind over here, though the pressure from Aurora has been pretty solid. And you're losing some pressure out elsewhere. Paul, 
deals a little bit of damage. And that does remind me, Trelly, you know, we, we talk a lot about the late game, Naja and Hell. But the early game, they almost killed Hebo. They almost killed Lazbra on the Nemesis. And if either of those kills happen, as opposed to Sino going down for first blood, it could have been a very different landscape for the ferryman uh, as opposed to what we saw. It definitely could have been. But it wasn't. Yep, and we're not li <laughs> we're not living in the could have been. We're we're li we're living in what happened, and unfortunately, Six Ferryman got off to a bad start this game. The duo lanes looking just fine. With Mike going away, it means he did fall behind a bit. Aurora has been getting very aggressive on this area. It's a pick that's been banned away from him time and time again. He doesn't have much steal potential, so it looks like pull the purple buff under tower is the call. And just make sure that it gets confirmed. I do want to dial in just a bit, though, about Dardez's pick once again. Because it doesn't have the greatest matchup into hell, but it has just fantastic CC. This lane is not big enough to really warrant an immobile pick like Baron not working, right? He can sit under tower just fine. As long as he's got his three, he's got tremendous peel. And if Sino sashes in and you get up into the life of the party he's ulting out like guaranteed yep. the beads is not going to be enough you're too close you don't even get value out of beads if you use them so i think it's a great pick in general here sino realizes hey i might have more more success he missed whiffs the ult and now mike he dashes away lasmer's rotated and it's gonna be first blood one more time for the dragons they're gonna chase down another though and it's a double kill looking for three but just the right amount of distance on the dash saves Cyclone Spin. Wow. And it is a second time catastrophic for the Ferryman. And the Dragons are able to pick up two. I'm pretty good at reading lips. And what I just saw was, my bad, my bad, my bad. <laughs> that, 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 that is what Sino just said. There was no beads on Mike. And the issue is, if he takes him up right away, it, it wasn't like they had that much kill potential. He had to get him a little bit lower. And once he did, unfortunately, just could not land the wind fire wheels. And what looked like a fantastic gank for the Styx Ferryman ends up netting two kills over to Lazra for the J Dragons. He gets credit for both of them. This nemesis has been on a tear in game number one and continuing into game number two. Not going to stop Aurora from getting aggressive. Vote wants to pop the ultimate. Does have beads, but has to save it for the ult. Unless the chains run through, then he can dash away. Beautifully played. Unless Aurora... We got a solo kill over on right? No, okay. I was going to say, he comes through. Good body blocks from Mike. At the very least, Lazarus still going. Yeah, and Mike does exactly what is necessary to make sure his carry stays alive. The bullying potential from Aurora has just been there consistently. And, you know, we've seen a few errant Ares pit or bans, not even picks, just bans towards the ferryman. This is why, right? This is very irritating to deal with. You need the beads. Lazarus is going to be in a little bit of trouble if he finds himself near Aurora anytime in the nearby future. But as you mentioned, is able to go over instead for the jungler. Show up next to Nika. Kill off Baskin, who was already on to a rough start. Oh, the juke. And you got to talk about just rough, rough, rough overall for the ferryman. That kill slipping through their hands. You mentioned it. Juke shoes on for Dardes. Mike he, goes for a deep He had ult. Finds the shot. Oh, Dardes maybe could have done something to pull it around. Cyclone spin, though, locked up around two. Dash is good. Looking for Mike. What kind of walls, what kind of CC do you have? None. And with the wave of ferrymen that are walking over this way, they're going to opt not to fight. Well, the ferrymen left them. Roar's still getting aggressive. Sino's coming around the top. It looks like it's just going to be a little bit of back camp bandit time. Steal away what you can. And then just casual reset. Yeah, Dardes did not have to die there. He didn't think he, the range was there, but you have so many mitigations in life of the party. If he ulted the second he was slowed, he was 100% fine. There's no way. Paul's diving that tier 2 tower. But unfortunately, didn't think he had to, and falls down to the range and the poke of Paul. There hasn't been much pressure from Lazbra in mid. He's been looking towards those side lanes, and I guess that's made Dardes just get too poked out. That's that, kind of the benefit of picking this hell. You've got twice the abilities of just about everyone else in the mid lane, which means you can spam them as much as you want. And because he's just got increased range and he's got the cleanse for the, the wrap it up, Dardes just doesn't have too many answers until, you know, Lasper decides to get active over on that side of the map. Boat didn't end up using his beads, but has the dash for Aurora. And look here, yeah, Lazarus on the way. Aurora could be in some trouble, but it looks like Cyclone spins on the zone duty just to make sure no one gets near his support. And a little bit of roll reversal 
for him. Unfortunately, that amount of zoning creates some space for the dragons. They start up the Fury. Wall's there for Mike. Roar has the blink. Blink's yep. over. A little bit of damage. Dragons get the Fury. Roar CC just enough that the ult doesn't come out yet. Terra ult drops. Roar really wants to find a multi-man pull. Gonna have to settle just on Mike. And they're gonna get that kill pretty easily, but it comes at a massive cost. Didn't have bees, there was really no way that Mike was gonna make it out. He just wanted to make sure his team got away from him. No other value from that ultimate. It works out perfectly. I love the play from the walls to block, but unfortunately you gotta do a little bit of damage to Aurora, or he's gonna be able to blink over those. This is what I was talking about. The cleanse comes through, not enough. It looks like Sino is the target, but he ults out. And now without slice and dice, Paul should be fine. It's, yeah, Sino goes back in to make sure Paul gets out. That's a true jungler right there. He, he said, hey, your life is more valuable. You're 2-0, I'm 0-1. I'm, I'm going to go in here just to make sure you get out. I mean, that was true, like, secret service, Mr. President, yeah. get down. Like, I'm taking the shot. Hit the floor. <laughs> and that, to be fair, that was the correct call. Paul is just yeah. worth more. Two, you you, you want to make sure your 2-0 level 10 hell stays alive. And in this case, Sino made the, the, the hero play. 0-8, 0-3, 0-4. Doesn't matter. Sino's not soloing anyone. He's behind as is. Your ult is simply set up for your team at this point. That's what we were looking at last time. So I'm keeping my eyes on Sino for not only more hero plays, but who's going to follow up on that ult? Because we had talked about it. It was a spear rope super early last time from the ferryman. This time it's just immediately into the regrowth. Do you think, and, and I guess this is the better question. Last time, it was some CC reduction specifically to deal with the Dragon's comp. And then the Breastplate of regr Regrowth, because that's like the hell item. And then some damage towards the end. But it took so long to get to the damage. Do you think it's just better to, to one and done grab this? And then immediately start, start, I guess, picking up more damage. We'll hold that question, hold that thought. Double pull from Aurora. And no follow-up, despite no beads there for Vote. Vote doesn't have him still. Sino's trying to get over there. Good body blocks from Mike. And he's going to be the one who goes up to the air. Roar's taking a lot of damage. Lazbra alongside Dardes picking him up. And Sino can't escape that one. Double kill for the Baron on the rotation. And a great ult from Dardes to help lock people down. Yeah, Aurora is playing it so well. I mean, you have a CC immune dash on Shibalanke. If As long as you time Rising Jaguar right, you'll never get pulled. So what he does is he makes sure to hit the chain first, says, hey, now you can't dash, nerd, and then he goes for the ult. Gets a perfect pull, but Cyclone Spin doesn't follow up. He doesn't have the ult, and the Heart Bomb would have been body blocked. So they can't find anything. Sino comes in and says, all right, don't worry. I can hit the ult. But the body blocks from PBM were just too clean. When Fire Wheels takes up a Terra, when he lands, Dardes says, hey, you're invited to this party. Sino didn't want to go, but he didn't have a choice. Gets pulled into the coffin, and another easy kill there for the Jade Dragons. But to answer your question about the hell, I assume Sickle is next. I, I do think full damage is just better. <gasps> it looks like Paul made a change up. He's not going to go the Sickle. He is going to go damage. Uh, I think survivability is key at some points, but when you are behind, at a certain point, you living longer is useless. You yep. are just delaying the inevitable. Sometimes you need damage to turn the game around. And Paul in particular likes to survive and likes to heal up his team. He is a healer. It makes sense. But, you know, just last game in particular, I don't think that the double defense item was going to change too much. If Hebo wants you dead, more often than not, you're just going to die. But in this game, it's a little bit differently. You know, being able to zoom away from Lasbra, being able to zoom away from Nika, definitely good strats. And Paul recognized it said, hey, I'm not going to need the Spirit Rope. Maybe I don't go Sickle, but I will get a little bit more DPS online. Tier 1, you know, last time we talked a lot about the map. Maybe even now it'll have to wait, Sino. And every other Goodbye, member Mike. of the Ferrymen are here to kill Mike. They're going to do so pretty easily. Takes a little longer than they would like. Maybe rotate in to the Fury after their pick. Sino's low. Nika's rotated in. So the Dragons have four to play around. Sino's back to base. And you have to imagine they're running over towards what should be a very soon spawning Pyromancer. Maybe some invades. I'm surprised to see after a pick like that with a heavy rotation. 
the Ferrymen aren't going for the Oni Fury. Yeah, unfortunately, even with a five-man rotation, it did, they didn't seem confident enough, I would suppose. Uh, Baskin comes over, <laughs> says, hey, we're getting a kill. I don't care what it is, we are getting a kill. They end up grabbing it. Baskin doesn't have blink here, so there's no way he's able to catch Lazbro unless he turns around and tries to fight. But yeah, I, I would have liked to see an Oni Fury pull there, but again, just seemed like they weren't confident enough. They're like, hey, we got our pick. We wasted a little bit of farm to do so. Let's just make sure we get back and, and play a bit safer. XP-wise, everyone's looking relatively even, except that massive jungle differential that you would expect with Lazbro being 204. And Sino, of course, being down three levels. Yeah. Besides that, relatively even across the board. And the Sticks Ferryman are going to start up by pulling the Oni Fury. Mike is going to be the only one who can get here in time. They don't have too much steel potential. In fact, it looks like the Jade Dragons know this is happening. Mike's going to show up probably as it gets down and say, hey, let's just grab the Pyromancer. So an objective trade. And back to farming we go. Foda has been playing relatively safe. He knows exactly where Aurora is and knows how much of a threat this, this Ares has been in his lane. And he wants to make his home underneath this tower and pretty much just stay there. Well, towers. It's a good thing to talk about right now. Votes is almost dead. A couple hits from Cyclone Spin. If he had wanted to, he might be able to just step up ult and, and slam it. The tier one in mid for the Dragons, gone. So the farm game, at least on map, has been great. Unfortunately, Ooh. the kill game has been so heavily in favor of the Dragons. Blink and you miss it, Aurora deleted. But Trelly, because of the towers, because of the objectives, because of how things have gone, seven to three, the kills look so great in favor of the dragons. Yeah, that about eight hundred gold. That is going to need to continue to rise if the Jade Dragons want to feel more confident towards the Fire Giant. Turns out Lazra makes these tanks look not very tanky once that ultimate comes through. It's just a good rotation, good collapse. But I think a lot of that. Goal differential is probably going to be because of, number one, the objectives that the six airmen have been able to grab, and number two, a lot of the pressure in mid and over in duo. Paul grabs the tower early on. Tier one over on left looking worse for wear. A lot of minions have been pushed under, denying that gold. I think that's become a bit of a problem here for Vote. He'll be fine. He's matching the build of Cyclone Spin just fine, but has not been able to step forward, right? He, he has been playing a lot of this game underneath his tower, fearful of the blink in from Aurora, who already upgraded to the, the scorching blink, so there's a little bit of extra damage whenever he's able to land that relic before he goes in for his pull. I just imagine he blinks in, gets the pull, pulls them back onto the fire, and starts to add up and just make sure that he's doing tons of DPS uh, with that early scorching blink. But Mike w goes in for the bracer and the sprint. This Terra is going to be getting pulled in every single time, unless he gets a Magi's later on. Or, I guess, an Absolution. And it's going to take a while to build since he's going into what appears to be just a Spirit Rope. Terra says, hey, I've got I've got sustain. I've got some healing. I'll be fine if Aurora tries to focus me out. But I think as the game continues, that might come back to buy him depending on how the Sticks Ferryman decide to play it. Getting a pick onto the tanks before the fight starts can be disastrous if played correctly. It still floors me that it's only 700 gold separating these teams. <laughs> yep. 304, you had mentioned it now. Well, hovering two, two and a half levels up for Lazbra. I have to be worried about the summer's blessing. And the winter's bite. And the winter's bite. Yeah, exactly. That'll get you. The winter's bite is definitely uh, rougher, which I guess makes sense. It hits harder as well. And we are entering that stage of the game. I, you know, we, we've now got the Rada Tahuti. More damage immediately online for Paul. Last time, one of the things we were worried about was the fact that Paul, like, had built relatively tanky, wasn't doing a lot of damage. And Sino was playing Naja, which at this point is still pretty far behind. 0 3 and 2 isn't, as you had said earlier, going to be soloing anybody anytime soon. Does it have enough follow up in team fights? You know, not just picks. If you know they grab Mike here, oh man, you killed the support. But in you know, a full 5 on 5, is it going to be enough between the two of them now? Or with Cyclone joining? that this Naja and this Hell feel a little stronger. Seems like we'll get to find out maybe sooner than I anticipated. Fight starting up, lights turned off, Aries in the air, and he's not gonna get a pull this time around. Instead, Basket hung out to dry, and an eighth kill on the board for the Dragons. Aurora was low, third HP, forced to run back. Sino Paul, Cyclone, 
full health bars. But do they want to answer back? Primal Fury started by the Dragon. Sino leads the way forward, and that is a massive stun from Nika. No big follow-up, so no massive damage. But Roar, unfortunately, has to eat the brunt of it here. And now it's a dash forward and a chase down onto the carry. Sino, half health, forced away. Paul's healing. Cyclone spins damage. Still going to stay present around the Primal Fury. The Ferryman, despite being down two, want to try the fight. Feeling confident in themselves, I know. Eating a lot of poke, but they've got a lot of healing. Unfortunately, the healing's not going to be enough to get them back into position. Teleport from Baskin down. But the Primal falls before they can get anything rolling. And, and that's just, uh, I'm not going to say overconfidence, but I think... The, the tank's on the side of the Ferryman. Aurora already got a taste of it once, but Baskin, unfortunately, had not. You are not as tanky as you think when yeah. there's a nemesis in play. I, I mean, Baskin stands at the forefront of the fight. He's 1v5ing. He's like, I'm Hercules. Lazarus says, all right, I'm going to ult you. You are no longer Hercules. We don't care. Dardos gets a massive pull back in, pulls Aurora <laughs> and Baskin simultaneously, gets the stun onto Baskin and uses that ult to immune life of the party. And then, yeah, uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, the, the shred is just ridiculous. And because of that, the tanks became a non-factor. And sure, the carries stick around. Paul, Cyclone, and Sino are like, hey, maybe we can go in for a defense here. But it's just not possible. No one is standing up to Lazbra at the moment. These auto attack cancels with the Hydra's procs from the shield have been chunking. And of course, once he pops that Erendite, you're not going to outrun him either. Yeah, very difficult <laughs> to deal with. And man, having a hell of a game. Right now. Well, that's Paul. Well, you're right. You're right. Paul is having <laughs> one, exactly one hell of a game. Of a game. <laughs> I guess technically today he's had two hells of a game. The walls, man. Well placed by Mike. Root is good. Doesn't even have a lot of follow-up. Nika teleports in. Maybe they want more to go out of this. Aurora goes into the air. CC immunity is good from Nika. Mike gets pulled, and he wants it as they chase it down. Sino's getting low. Great three-man stun from Mike, and it keeps the fight going. They lock down Sino, and that single pick opens up a conversation. The conversation, 1940 into the game. Can you start the fire giant? And how comfortable around that can you feel? Dragons are slowly making their way over there, but Trelly, seems like they don't seem to think the answer is yes just yet. So it's a little more scattered to the wind, farm up, see what you can do. Yeah, my guess is they said, all right, everyone, we're all level 18, good, let's go over to Fire Giant. And the vote's like, ahem, I have three items. Like, wait, what's up? Like, the Hunters are a little bit behind at the moment. Vote would rather just get farm. Fire Giant's all well and good, but if he's able to hit, get a tower, get level 18, get a second or one more item online, Fire Giant looks a little bit easier. Your Phoenix Siege looks a little bit better. That's probably the call here from the J Dragons. Uh, we've seen time and time again what happens when the Shibalanke gets to the Phoenix line with a full build. You pop ult, you auto it like six times and the Phoenix dies. Vote is a, a ways away from being able to do that just yeah. because of how the ADCs have been starved a bit for farm. There's been a lot of fighting on the left side of the map. And in doing so, that means Cyclone and Vote are going to be a little bit behind the 8-ball in terms of doing FG. But the 6 variant said, hey, we don't care about that. We've lost every fight so far this game, but we're going to show up to the Fire Giant ready to pull. 80% and they got plenty of sustain. Beads are up, CC immunity's there for the dragons. You had mentioned it though, sustain. That's really the big key. You can go in and heat check the fire giant, see what the dragon's response time is gonna be. And your worst case scenario is you let Paul heal you up and then you back away. It's still almost 5,000 gold. The dragons need a little bit more to push themselves over. It's 4,500 currently. Fury gonna be up in about 30, Pyro. About 30 after that. And that feels like right now, Trelly, that's going to be where some of the strength points are. A lot of global gold going over towards the Dragons. Tier 1 in left, cleared out a second ago. Tier 1 in right just now. So Tier 1 in mid, the last one still standing for the Ferryman. Otherwise, they've still got all three Tier 3s. And it's a very similar map state for the Dragons in that they've got one Tier 1. It's one hanging out over and right. Still even has both of its Bastions standing up right now. And then all the tier twos relatively untouched. So gold lead feels pretty massive in favor of the dragons. Experience lead, massive in favor of the dragons. I mean, you got two level 20s uh, looking to approach three pretty quickly. Meanwhile, Sino's still three levels down. 
But it's going to be fight lead and siege lead, which when you look at the, the top, at least 10 to 3 for the kills. Leans in favor of the dragons for the fights. Pyromancer spawned in. And it seems like the teams are still looking for that one perfect pick to open things up. And that's sort of the issue at the moment, is it's been a lot on Aurora to try and engage here. Bastion on the Hercules certainly could as well. The Pyromancer will drop down. The Six Fairy, I'm going to grab that one. Looks like Sino wants to pick up the Runic Bomb, and Cyclone Spin has one as well. So two in tow for the Styx Ferryman. Maybe Lasper tries to solo out the Gold Freeman, which is in a terrible play. He's got plenty of damage, but here's that engage we were talking about. Aurora and Baskin go to the back line, but they're by themselves. And they're getting shredded pretty quickly. Baskin stands in front of them. The autos ring true from Vote. They just need a little more, and it's Dardes with the last hit. The team works together. Aurora goes up. Aurora pulls no one. He's put down in the ground. And now the pull from Dardes tries to get things rolling. Cyclone's been forced to run away. A lot of damage to Alu Assault. And the chase down from Nika. A couple autos. And he seals the deal. They pick up Sino. A double for Vote. And four gone on the Ferryman. Four gone is going to be what this Fire Giant is here in a second. Unless Paul tries to stick around, tries to get something done. Goes for the slow and the 1v4. And he pays for it. Full on Deicide. Dragons 15 to 4 and 2340 in. They're going to start up the Fire Giant, get it for free. What well, a, get it for Dardes. What a <laughs> puzzling engage there. I mean, again, I'm not exaggerating. Baskin and Aurora were by themselves. There was no follow up. That was just a tank dive. And they decided to go for it. And it did not work out. Fire Giant drops. Baskin teleports in. You may think that was a waste, but I think that was a great play. If, if they decide to wait for Dardes five more seconds and a Hercules shows up, you have a chance to steal. So you're just guaranteeing that Dardes doesn't get Fire Giant was the reason for that teleport. Baskin's happy with that one. But again, it's all great if your tanks dive the back line. Everyone likes tanks that dive the back line. The issue becomes, where's the follow-up? And again, Cyclone was nowhere to be found. Paul was trying to stay close to cleanse Baskin on his way out. But it really didn't seem like the Styx Ferryman were on the same page there. Paul ends up doing some good damage, and Cyclone does go to the back and actually pick up Dardes. He re they recognize, hey, your beads are down. You're in the threshold of Windfire Wheel, so I'm going to go trade one for one. Don't hate that play. But didn't like the engage, and it becomes so difficult. Aurora and Sino are trying to play the beads burn game for each other, and I haven't seen it really work out much this game. You know, the, the blink yeah. in, no escape, pull beads. Okay, Sino, now you have an opening, or vice versa. It happened once, right there. Dardes beats go down, Sino goes in. Out of their four kills. It's got to work a little bit more than that if you want to not get behind this far. Yeah, got to try and find that combo. Fire Giant. You know what? Charlie, it still lands on the important members. You might like Dardes to have it, but You're I saying, love vote having yeah, it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, especially if he just, like you said earlier, at any of these Phoenix lines, if he has a clear line of sight, just pops ult and kills it. He's got that point in the build. You'd kind of mentioned it earlier. Although not a lot of damage in the last item that we've seen him pick up since that conversation came through. A lot of attack speed, which theoretically means more damage over time here. <laughs> and after watching that tier 2 get shredded, yeah, I'm inclined to think so. The Dragons, minute 10 left in the power play. Fury's up on the left. They still got a tier 2 on right. Doesn't seem like we're going to be getting to the Phoenix line anytime soon. Yeah, the Death Temper going to help him out as well. He was able to upgrade his starter, so... I think Vote's doing just fine for the time being. But man, 3-0 and 10 for the Chivalanke, 5-0 and 8 for Lazbra, and 3-0-6 for Nika. Of course, Mike's doing great, you know, 0-2-11. Support stat lines never get the credit they deserve. But the fact that Vote, Nika, and Lazbra have not died is also a bit of an issue. Especially because think about how much pressure was put on a Vote. I mean, Aurora, I would argue 90% of his chains have been on yeah. the Chivalanke. And Vote just... He's living. He just goes, yeah, man, cool. Yeah, more often than not, he just didn't beat. Sometimes he just got pulled, and he's like, nope, you're not getting my beats. Yeah, I could Rising Jaguar out of this ult, but I'm just going to let it slide. And I think the damage numbers start to paint a bit of a picture here. Baskin towards the bottom. This Hercules has not been able to get active, find these poles, find these massive CC chains. And it's because why would you get to the back line if you're just, number one, going up against all these carries that do way more damage than you. Number two getting 25% of your protection shredded and 25% of your health gone immediately when Lasper decides to ult you, because that's been the play. And then there's no follow-up even if you do hit the CC. The carries on the side of the ferryman 
do not share the luxury of being able to walk up that far. They don't have blinks. They're not. They don't do enough damage. They have to stay very far back. And because of that, it's been a lot of mindless engage. Look at that ult, <laughs> and the Phoenix is starting to go pretty quickly. At that, even an engage, Nika. And move forward. Cyclone's still pushing. Maybe just zones a little bit. Cyclone's Get a gonna bomb. answer. Phoenix for Phoenix here. So the Dragons now immediately want to get something else done. Luckily, it was two Phoenixes for the price of one. Fire Giant's going to spawn back in in 10 seconds. And with this amount of zone and Cyclone. He's going to go in. <laughs> still on the other side of the world. Fire Giant seems free, but like you said, he might just keep pushing. He's got a minion wave. Paul getting shredded around the fight. Cyclone's on the Titan. Paul's dead. So there's two places you got to keep your eyes. How much damage does he have? And can not anyone get much. their back? <laughs> he does not have enough. Had he stayed any longer, I think Lazarus would have come in. and Lazarus might still chase him down. Showing him what for. Yeah, has the opportunity. Ares ult, and he pulls in. It's massive. It looks beautiful. There's no one nearby. The dragons clean up the support, have fire minions in mid, and they're going to start lining up. With Cyclone Spin off on the other side of the world, Lazarus just has to stop the back. Yeah, stall him, and he does so. But it's a dangerous trade for him. Looks for the 1v1. It's the Titan Room for the rest of the Dragons. Lazarus loses the 1v1. The bounty goes over towards Cyclone Spin, but it's going to cost him the game. Sino's gone. Baskin, he manages to live just long enough to watch the Titan go dra down. The Dragons go up to zero and put themselves on set point. And Lazbara makes the hero play. Says, you know what, I'll risk my undying streak here just to make sure that Cyclone can't back and we can end the game. 6-0, 6-1. Uh, I'm sure he's happy with either. Uh, without your ADC, again, the tanks were just looking too bad. Mike was walking in freely. They had so much burst. I'm really glad that, number one, the Baron mid was even played, and number two, that it looks so good. In a matchup like that with Naja, I think it just makes Sino's life so difficult. Anytime he sashes into Baron, if Baron does not die, we saw Cyclone, or Sino either A had to ult out or B yeah. he was dying. His stat line didn't look good at the end of that game, partly because of that reason. And we get to see a combination that, that people, I saw people in chat questioning going into that, the hell, Naja, why go back to it when it didn't work out too well, didn't good work question. out well here. And some of the changes they made, uh, unfortunately, falling a little flat there for the Ferryman. The fights, the kills, the gold, a lot of the objectives, uh, anything you can name in the game yep. pretty much goes over towards the Dragons this time around. And they put themselves up 2-0. Just one more. They secure a third seed. They secure some money. And they secure a great spot looking forward towards Masters. But they still have one more to go to try and get there. It's reverse sweep time for the Ferryman. We'll see if they can do it right after this.
Hello and welcome back to the SPL playoffs match number one and game two of that one goes to the Jade Dragons notch themselves now a 2-0 lead in this best of five third place seeding match here up against the Sticks Ferryman and game number two very similar to game number one Mifflin an early lead started out by the Jade Dragons and added to them at least at the hands of Lasbra over into the dual lane getting the ball rolling a little bit early getting those three kills up. Six Ferryman again able to at least mitigate some of that lead even with all those kills going that way we able to hold firm. But as this late game started scaling through, this Jade Dragons composition continues to spiral out of control. Yeah, just the team fight seems to be where the Six Famine are really hitting their struggle, isn't it? They can't quite grasp how to either stop the aggression from the Jade Dragons or how to mount their own aggression. It seems like at every given opportunity, the Six Famine are trying to split across the map or maybe try and split push some towers or go for the opposite objective, whereas the Jade Dragons, for the most part, have been grouped up playing together, looking for picks, and finding them consistently. I would argue that uh, a lot of it likely does root itself in composition once more, where realistically, how are the Styx Ferrymen securing their kills? It's pretty difficult with a draft like that. Uh, I think it's got to be the jungle pick now. Now with two games data in this set, and a combined 1, 12, and 6 performance from Sino, I think I think you have to bench the the Naja here. Look look at something else, anything else, uh, to get things rolling. Some aggression and initiator. At, at this point, with the performances that I've seen in this set in particular, I would almost even say go back to the Nike or the Surter. Just get something different because it, it is clearly not working out. And when you look at his direct opposition on the other side, and it's the primary reason I decided to bring this up, Lazra is having a phenomenal set here for the Jade Dragons. Uh, a combined KD of 11, 2, and 15 from him. So, numbers don't lie. I think this one's a bit of a jungle diff. A jungle for the J Dragons has really stepped up here in this set today. Also, a vote of 3 0 12 game for himself. Dart is 5 2 and 8 on the Baron. We had a little bit of questions as to how the Baron's performance in mid might be. And even despite being dove essentially at the tier 2 tower fairly in the game by Paul, that did not seem to slow down Dart is in his momentum here. For the Jade Dragons now notch themselves their second win in this best of five. One more game for the Dragons to win out, and they win out the set. Meanwhile, Six Fairman have to go on a pretty long path for themselves. A full reverse sweep would be needed in order to win out this one and take that third seed moving into the Masters event for themselves. But I think i got to echo your sentiments there. The, the, the Naja hasn't been performing as well. Sana's been missing maybe one too many abilities in these early skirmishes, which has cost him. In game number one, he misses a Sash on the Lasbra, ends up being the one who dies because of that one. In game number two, he goes over to the left lane, to the duo to try and get a gank, misses ultimate on PBM, and then his teammates end up dying because of that one and him alongside there. So the early performance of the Naja has left a little bit to be desired here for the Sticks Fairman. We'll see what changes they make here in game number three for the Picks and Bands up against the Jade Dragons. Remember, up 2-0 in the best of five. Third place seeding for Masters on the line, or at least third place out of this event, I should say, towards seeding to win for that Masters. Six Fairman, they won't change up at least their first band, no reason. To take the emoji away from themselves, or to take the emoji out, and things keep it out of Mike's hands. But maybe interesting that Aurora so unwilling to to grab that one, or maybe they just don't want to have that in a first pick selection. Uh, I, I think Aurora has has been very happy with the ability to play the more standard aggressive picks. If anything, I would just say he's he's comfortable on on things like Ares, like Maui. Uh, the Horus comes to mind as well. The in your face picks. Uh, otherwise. If given the option between Yamoja and Ganesh, I'm sure that Aurora is taking the Ganesh. Uh, his, his performances on that god, bar none, some of the best that we've seen from him so far this year. Uh, and so in taking away the Yamoja, maybe gives himself one more shot or a potential shot at, at grabbing the Ganesha for himself. Nemesis is a ban for the Styx Ferryman, an adaptation that I think we were all pretty likely to see. Uh, the Nemesis has just been too good for Lazbra. Already broke down his KD, but if you missed it, again, it is 11, 2, and 15 so far this set, and that is both on Nemesis. So, a major pressure point for the Six Ferryman, addressed early in the bands. J Dragons will still stick to the standards, at least for now, however, it will be the Mamana, the Baba Yaka. No reason for the J Dragons to switch anything up. They've been finding success with their compositions here to start out games one and two. Marty band away by the Styx Ferryman, just a standard hunter at this point through. You still, still think maybe though, Myth, that Marty is kind of that top hunter of the game right now that's been warranting these bands. He's gotten a couple of nerfs that have come this way, hitting a little bit of his ultimate, hitting some of his combo damage. Does he maybe still sit at the top of the hunter or is this just kind of a, a nuisance point that teams don't want to deal with? You know, it's actually a very nuanced question, J-Mac. I, I think that Marty, of course, 
incredible as a hunter, but I wouldn't want Marty as my only hunter. I feel like Marty facilitates the double hunter composition. Like when we saw the AMC meta, was it that AMC was the best guy in the game or was it that AMC allowed you to have a double hunter draft which could go for pressure in both mid and duo and then transition into early objectives? I think it's more so that. It's the 40% penetration. It's the, the safety that Marty brings, the objective play. So banned out by the six ferryman makes a good deal of sense to me and then they grab the other hunter that has been the talk of the town the hachiman a very safe pick one of the best boxers good scaling really utilizes that yellow numbers build to the fullest extent odysseus bow is just ridiculous on this pick if you're landing your autos from downtown and i could trust that cyclone spin maybe not looking the most confident or energetic on your screen right now certainly capable so of, uh, of sure landing his shots a, okay he moved he moved his eyes i was about to say did he just like pass out open eyes in the chair at that point through. Cyclone still, he's still kicking. Here with the Six Fairy, it will be Hachiman and then Hercules. And hell this time for the Jade Dragons. Now, we've seen oh, Mike take man. the hell. We've seen Dardes take the hell. So still some flexibility with the pick on the Jade Dragon side of the field. I hope it's Dardes. I really do. And I, and I have to agree with you, just in the sense of that Mike has not the, had the best performance on some of the more healer style of support Mike loses mages. on mage supports, yes. yes we can say not, it. Just say not, it. He's not been doing good on mage supports, it, unless it's Nox. He's doing good on Nox, but he doesn't play it very often. So instead, Hell Hercules. On the opposite side, Tyr locked in for the six ferryman alongside the Hebo for Paul. And you wanted more damage out of your mid laner? This will do just that. This is potentially the best look at a composition from the six ferryman this set. I, I think when you have a player that is the caliber of Paul, when you've got a Paul Berger on your team, you want to play through him. Hell can do it, but not with a defensive build. Hebo's going to do it no matter what because he's not going to build defense on Hebo. He's going to go for all damage. He's going to try and one-shot the back line. And even in the losses that we had just seen, I'm remembering good plays from Paul where he's diving Dardes in Tier 2 at level 8 and making it happen. So this is a good adaptation as far as I'm concerned. You've got Baskin. Uh, on one of his playmakers, the tier looked good in lane and transitioned to the team fight phase very well. Now with Hell or off the table on your team and instead against you, you can trust that Paul's going to have the damage to follow up. Well, with the Terra locked in, this will confirm Hell going over to Dardes in mid for the Jade Dragons. And now we jump into the second wave of bands. A collective sigh of like relief. Through. Yeah, I know. Everybody's kind of like, okay, Hell's back in mid. Not for Paul. This time on the opposite end. So now Dardes gets to have a little bit of fun with the heal, and I wonder what Dardis' kind of build path will be for one like this, because traditionally for Paul, he's going to build a little bit tankier, maybe get two, sometimes three defense items if he needs to. I think in the last game, he only went for the one defensive option, and then focus more in towards damage, so I wonder if Dardis will echo maybe at least that same style of build. Bans towards a roar from the Jade Dragons, a Ganesh and a Horus once more. Sticks Ferryman will split up their bands, taking a Fenrir and a Shibalanke off the table. Was there a Surkat nerf, Shadow nerf, that, that released overnight? What What is going on? Nobody interested in taking the Surkat for themselves. You can still get it, I guess. She just has really good 100-0 to zero potential, decent early game, great late game, pick base god, 100% anti-heal. There's a triple healer composition on the Jade Dragons right now. Feels like maybe that 100% could probably just make it difficult for a hell to exist. We'll see if the Six Ferryman elect to take that one for themselves. Haven't seen it from Sino in the past. Don't imagine we see it here. And the Naja does remain available through 10 bands and 8 total picks. So if that's any indicator that sticks very even about how concerned the Jade Dragons are about that Naja, I think they should think twice about going towards it. What would you take here? Sino could play Thor. A lot of the targets, every target on the Jade Dragons doesn't really have a great answer to Wall. Cleanse, of course, for Anvil of Dawn could make things a little bit trickier, but Thor certainly a, a very powerful pick. Doesn't necessarily have any poor matchups in the direct jungle, except for Surkat, which is miserable, and Lazra is capable, which might be why Sino is considering just about anything else right now. But if that's the case, I'm thinking Surkat for Lazra is just okay. All right. All right, then. It's ESET. It worked last time. It worked last time. We got to say that first. That is ESAT jungle, and it did work the last time we had seen it. Uh, silences. Last time it was double silence for the Six Ferryman to play around that ESAT this time around. It's just the one. And it will be a Thor for the Jade Dragons. Who's your target? I mean, if you're timing the cleanse well, I mean, you could say it for anybody, but if you're timing the cleanse well, it feels like ESAT's really going to struggle on ganks there. 
This is a good objective-based composition. Anytime you've got circle protection, objective's viable for that team. But now, Eset, who uh, last time we had seen her play, I had said one of the primary difficulties is her ability to actually channel Wing Gust, especially in late-game engagements. I'm looking at the other side, and I'm seeing plenty of ways to stop Wing Gust. A wall from Thor, a push from Hercules, maybe just some damage from the ROM. It's high execution, to be sure, but with the backs against the wall and at a tournament point, for the six ferrymen, they fall back to the eclectic. Giving Sino a pick that was working very well for him in the SCC. Worked very well when he brought out early this tournament an 8 KDA on it whenever he performed for his first SPL debut with the God. And Hebo for Paul, something that when you look back at the history of Paul, this has always been one of those pocket picks. When I think of Paul, even of the SCC days, jumping right up into the SPL, I think Hell, I think Uller, and then I think Hebo immediately after, and then rarely, at least at the time when she was met, a Freya, but we haven't seen Freya at least in a hot minute there. So this definitely feels like one of the quintessential Paul style of picks. The Maui has really been working well for Aurora in the times that he's been able to play that there. And then Hachiman, just a standard one over there. And then I've got no complaints for basking on just about any pick out over here. But is this a composition that can work for the six fairy against Jay Dragons? The problem that we've been seeing from the ferryman has been a bit of a slow early game. Once you get to the late game, the team fight has kind of been where the fall apart has been. Is this a composition for the ferryman that can work much stronger in the team fights against the Dragons? I think so. You've, I mean, anytime Paul's on Hebo, you, I trust him to get two every time. You know what I mean? He's going to, he's going to grab two in the fight. So it's on the rest of the team to get the other three. But what this Sticks Ferryman composition is going to do very well is coin toss objectives. It's not a coin toss. It's a weighted coin toss. Somebody check their dice. You know, that it is going to go their way every single time so long as they can hit the low bar of dropping circle protection on whatever they are fighting, be it Pyro, Gold Fury, or Fire Giant. And then you've got the double confirmation advantage in that Crushing Wave or even Water Cannon probably just does more damage than anything individually that the Jade Dragons can do. So I would love to see the Six Fairmen keep their head down, farm up in the early, group up, get to that first objective, and then start playing the game. We'll see if the Ferryman can do just that. Can they win out the early game, get those team fights, and take us to game number four? Or are the Jade Dragons going to shut them out here? Let's jump right into game three with Gore and Trelly. And it's one Trelly that could cement itself, I believe, only one other 3-0 so far this tournament. So the Dragons looking to make a stamp on this game, show what they have to offer. <laughs> and it's Sino on the East Set Jungle, and Lazbra on the Thor. Chat still seems to be leaning in favor of the Dragons, 55% over towards them. But I think the jungle matchup needs to be talked about. Yesterday, Lazarus Thor left us wanting a little more. Sino's E set, I would argue very surprisingly, in the SPL level. Kind of went ham. It did. <laughs> It did. <laughs> yeah, there was a moment. There was pure contemplation on Trelly. Like I couldn't tell if that was a. How did I get here? It was more of I didn't. <laughs> I didn't want to agree with you, but unfortunately, Gore, you were spitting. Uh, it, it did work out. I think Sino knows exactly when to go in with the East, which is a big deal because it's 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 a hard pick to pilot. You have to play very safe when you don't have aggressive positioning. Sino starting blink here means that Lasbro is going to have a pretty easy time finding poke onto him with the wall, and of course. Yeah, the, he has 100 to 0 potential with the ultimate as long as circle protection just doesn't just get dropped on him. So those are things he might have to worry about. At this point, Cyclone takes a good bit of damage. This is the issue with trying to step up. You have to kill a minion to get level 2, and sometimes it's hard to do. But you lose your beads. Vote also traded his beads out, so I suppose just every relic used in the duo lane. Probably won't see anything come from that, unless these junglers hit level 5 very quickly, which usually doesn't happen. But I think that Lazbra and Sino are going to be controlling the pace of this game, depending on who gets started first. Stun from Mike on the Cyclone, from Aurora on the Mike. It feels like that that's going to be the chain that we see a lot in the duo lane. I'm really excited for this little area, right? The mid 2v2, eventually 3v3 if supports turn whenever they rotate over. But we've talked about it, what Thor can do to bully a Hebo. I think that kind of doubles, at least to some extent, for an E-set. He's rotated in for the shield buff. We'll watch what Sino decides to do here. Mike and Vote have been pushed up pretty far. Dardes walled off, double tap, not going to connect. Teleports to the hammer, gets the autos. 
And Dardes picks up the kill. First blood, simple and clean for the Dragons. Yep, that's about as easy to get. I mean, Hebo can't get over the wall. Last replaces it perfectly. Even teleports a little bit too far to get the body blocks, but it didn't matter. There was plenty of damage there from Darda as Hell just has so many abilities. That's going to be an easy first blood going the way of the Hell, as well as those beads going down for Paul, which means at a level 5, Lazra can do that again very easily, mind you, uh, with the end of Dawn. He should be able to hit 5 before Paul gets close, assuming that, you know, Darda is pushing the waves under properly and looking to invade. And I would love to see Lazra right at level 5 look towards the mid lane. Especially with Dardes nearby, he could cleanse the knockup, he can make sure that the damage is all there, and just put another kill towards this immobile Hebo with no beads. Well, tier 2's quick first blood, and maybe a necessary performance right now for the Dragons. 3-0 shutout, not only securing a third C, but I think getting Talk going around your team, showcasing some of the balancing oh, points. Oh, is he dead? They're gonna body block, yeah, he's lock gone. down, one more hit. Oh, and poor Paul, that's twice in a row and nothing you can do about it. Mike this time facilitating Dardes. Gets his mid laner off to a 2-0 start. Yeah, Terra is just a fantastic matchup into Hebo as well. Your only form of self-peel is a knock-up, which Terra does not care about. Anytime it's a stone down, she can't be knocked up. She says, hey, I can easily grab either A, your beads, or B, your ult. Every time I decide to dash in with the monolith, and since Paul didn't have either of those things, Dardes gets the free cast on him. And once again, still no beats for a minute. Lazver has an opportunity to put 0-3 on the board, but Paul does take over to level 5, so he would have to pre-ult. He has the ability at least to pre-ult the Anvil of Dawn, which honestly would be difficult to do. Lazver's close by. I'm wondering if he'll go for it. He's got a buff and the mid camps to go for. Maybe because it's already 2-0 and it's not worth that much. And honestly, with Lazbro's HP this low, he's in Crushing Wave and, and Waterhand's death range. Probably smart not to go for it. Still want to see it. Oh, yeah, I just for want, sure. I just want good dunks, man. That's all I ever want from a Thor. Me watching the NBA Finals and Smite. <laughs> I just want good dunks, good man. Dunks. <laughs> You don't think that there's a lot in common between basketball and Smite. Actually, there's a lot more than maybe you would uh, you would expect. I remember uh, this is maybe off point. We'll get on the rails in just a second. That was a conversation I had with FDOT all the time. Was like He would compare roles in Smite to roles in basketball. It was always very fun to listen to his opinions on it. Right now, the only opinion I'm wondering is the dunk doesn't connect. Wall is good. Double tap is there for some damage on the side. No, no follow-up. Silence is good. Um, Lasbra forces an uncomfortable position from Sino. And I believe the blink as well on top of that. So the dunk, while it didn't connect, still finding value. Mike is looking to punish Paul again. But Paul just walks forward. Might not be the call. No shot. He has the damage, but not the health bar. What? And that is going to be a 3-0 lead for the Dragons. All of them on the mid laner and all of them on to Paul. I mean, Paul had the opportunity to ult out, and he kept, you know, doing the back step where he's like, maybe I'll ult out and clip them. Maybe I'll ult out and get a kill. And then he said, you know what? Forget ulting out. I'm ulting in. <laughs> he, <laughs> he did not have the damage to get a kill at all. It was never close. He just wanted to do damage, I suppose. And I'm pretty sure if he ulted out, he would have lived. So maybe a bit greedy there. 3 not the best start here for this Hebo, but it's because of the pressure put onto him from PBM. I mean, this tank, and one oh, more, not again. he's going to keep going, they can't live here. Just the dash doesn't hit, point. though. Oh, doesn't slow him. Dardes secures the green buff, but you know what, Shelly? Instead of a death this time, it's Back just a TKO, base. right? So <laughs> hey, you might not limit him from farming for as long, but you're still limiting him from farming. If you're looking at it, it's two levels in mid right now. And this reminds me of, uh, you know, questions when asked about, like, playing against Mike, playing against a Roar. Almost always the description is, man, that guy's just annoying. <laughs> yep. Which is the best thing you can be as a supporter. Yep, 100% true. If you're annoyed by the way the enemy support is playing, they are playing extremely well. They're putting you out of position. They're making you, you know, constantly look over your shoulder. I don't think Paul is going to confidently pull a green buff for the rest of the game. It's already been twice now where he's been ambushed. Once he died, and once he got very close to dying. 
So, you know, looking over your shoulder constantly to see where this Terra is and if she can CC you. And I will say, Paul has not had beads up for more than like a minute at a time. It has constantly been yeah. down. The second they come back up, they are already being forced. I think the Jade Dragons know exactly what this Hebo can do late game, and they are trying to A, limit how fast he can get there, and B, maybe just not let him get there. Yeah. That seems to be the game plan. I mean, Lazra only showed up for the first one of all of this bullying. Yep. Still haven't seen what could be the dunk setup, I think, coming up next. And, of course, seeing maybe where they are. Still seems like a nice light-hearted air in the Dragon's booth. Always nice when you see a pause. Like, the the frustration hands is what I'm going to call that for Nika, right? You're, throw, you're sitting back, and you're just like, I'd rather be playing right now. But the smiles are still there. They're joking with each other. And I think that's exactly the kind of mood that you would probably be feeling in, right? If you're you're Dardis, you're up two levels already, just a few minutes in, uh, and you've been getting the kills. Meanwhile, on the other side, not quite as happy. They're just trying to figure out the pause pause right now, but definitely something that you, you have to imagine is being discussed. Saying, "All right, what do we do, and how do we keep our Hebo? How do we keep this guy alive? <laughs> yeah, just alive, just in general, around." A little bit longer. TKO'd 9-7 in favor of Dardes. 3-0 in favor of Dardes. <laughs> Man, it feels like I, I want to talk, you know, it's like, oh, hey, you know what? We'll look at the solo lane, like Baskin's on tier. Maybe that changes anything. It feels like nothing on the side lanes right now is going to matter until we see some changes happening in mid. Because if Mike is going to continue bullying over here, or if Lazbra now with ult up is going to show up with another minute and ten before those beads are around. I mean, Paul might not be allowed to leave his tier one. The tier one, even though we're only seven minutes in, it might not be enough. It might not. And I think that's the main concern. But there is a bigger issue. I guess I'm not going to say it's a bigger issue. At the, at the current moment, it's a great strength. But the Jade Dragons have put all of their kills on a Dardis. So if this Hell gets picked, or if this Hell finds too much pressure towards them, that could be a shutdown, and that could, you know, be a bit of that gold deficit we've been talking about. Aurora takes a bit of damage here, but it looks like he's going to be just fine. Didn't have to use that landfall yeah. to try and juke out the damage. And once again, the pressure towards the mid lane. And Dart has recognized, hey, I don't have to go Breastplate of Regrowth or one of these physical damage items because there's a Hebo and there's an E-Set. Those are mainly the, the, the issues that I'm facing in mid lane. So Dryas goes into what I can only assume is a Genji's guard to get some magical defense this time around. I'm not going to be zooming around the map, I suppose, but we'll get a lot more CDR and be able to spam those abilities even more often. It gives them, like you said, significant choices. Plus, the only other person who might show up in this lane for the next, like, ten minutes is... <laughs> maybe not ten. Five minutes. A roar. So even more magical on top of that. I mean, you're going to be surviving pretty heavily if you're Dardes. Also, I mean, you had touched on it earlier, but I think it's just now fully clicking. But Sino, no beads. No CC immunity whatsoever. Maybe put to the test. Baskin's around, and they're just far enough apart that that dunk probably not going to be... A great idea. So Lazbra falls back to the blue buff. But for another four levels, Sino's going to struggle if he gets caught out in the jungle at any point in time. <laughs> Paul's going to struggle just in trying to survive. Keeps the beads this time, though. And it's that's that, a pretty big win. It's that green buff. Every time it's up, Mike's like, I'm going to go. <laughs> He's going to expect me from the front this time, so I'm going to wrap around from behind the tower. Doesn't end up netting too much. Just a little bit of poke onto this Hebo. But just goes to show, once again, Mike's trying to get in Paul's head. He's like, you you are never safe. You, even if you expect me from the left, I'm coming from the right. If you think I'm coming from the right, I'm already behind you. That, that's kind of a mindset here, trying to make sure the Hebo stays behind. I still think it's a bit of an issue that all of the kills go to Dardes because this hell could get shut down. So far, Dardes has had zero pressure put onto him except that one time Paul tried to ult out and ended up ulting in. But if you get that kill... Could change the dynamic of this game pretty heavily. The Jade Dragon certainly still in the driver's seat. They have the ability to go towards Gold Fury really at any moment. They don't have the overwhelming burst, but I would say if Paul and Sino are going in, getting that close to the objective, should definitely be falling down or at least putting some pressure towards them. You just have to look towards the burst potential, and I think Paul has that in spades. 
And if Sino gets his ult down, he's got the blink. It's not up at the moment, but he still does have it. He can go in for that circle of protection and just guarantee that any sort of objective goes freely to the Styx Ferryman. Which is why I think it's important that the Jade Dragons are pressuring as much as they can. They, they don't want to just get late game. Because if they do, Sino and Paul are going to control the Fire Giant and Gold Free pretty much for free. Paul manages to avoid both the root and the stun. You know what, Charlie? It's progress, right? We're making steps in the right direction. You had kind of mentioned it. It's the same thing we I've said in the past about Hunters. And that is that eventually he's still going to be a late game hebo. He's going to get the items online. He's going to have the damage. And what was two levels earlier has been shrunk down to just one, maybe one and a half if you're still far ahead. Gold Fury right now started up by the Dragons. Sino's going to go from back. There's going to be the landfall. Pulls in two. Mike... Was knock up immune. Ferryman, get that! And now they can maybe even walk forward. It's a great spirit ball coming from the E set. Secures one objective up into the sky for Lazbra. No, it's for both. Snipes come down. And nothing. <laughs> that is going to save you in that instance. The Ferryman. It might have been a rough start in mid, but a great last minute. Sino goes from behind, doesn't even drop the ultimate, just goes for a ranged spirit ball, and works out perfectly. Uh, you gotta watch out, the Jade Dragons do not have good burst. I'm amazed that they even went for that pull. Uh, when you don't know exactly where Sino is, he's got blink, he's got the better confirm by a mile. Baiting in for a fight, yeah, great call. But they didn't win the fight either. Just seems like the Styx Ferryman played that one as smart as they could, at the very least. The soul laners didn't ro rotate out, I suppose, so that's not the biggest deal now. That is going to equalize all that the Jade Dragons have tried to do and certainly put the Ferryman in the favor for now. Unless this Pyro goes down. It's going down very slowly here because it's just Dart as his DPS. Sino and Baskin are coming through, but it looks like it's going to go down. So the Pyromancer, at the very least, goes in favor of the Jade Dragons. And Mike will pick up that Runic Bomb. The question with Runic Bombs early on, it's always, where do they get used, when do they get used? And, and and if they're not used on towers, are they connecting with whatever else you're throwing them at? So we'll keep eyes on Mike for the next little bit. What would be, or should be in my mind, after a 3-0 start, a very insane lead for the Dragons, as we saw on the charts. It's not only not a lead in either aspect of experience or gold, but the experience... It's actually shifting pretty massively in favor of the Ferryman. And you're one and three here if you're Paul. And yet, you're level parity with Dardes. He's up. There's the dunk down onto Sino. No beats. No life. Therefore, Lazbra's able to kill that one off. Oh, but the wall. Cyclone ruins a couple of shots no there. Way. What a great play. Mike sets it up. Lazbra knocks him down. And they turn that into a quick 2-0. I mean, there was no way Sino ever lives. Again, 100-0 potential for sure with this build from Lazbra. But Cyclone could not even hit his ultimate because of the walls from Mike. Lazbra hides perfectly. And they're able to pick up two essentially for free. It looks like a dive. Lazbra ends up trading his life for a roar. He's a great play in. Boat's laughing. He said, hey, I'll take the kill and the tower. Thank you, please. I guess Lazbra's not worth that much, and the kill going to Aurora is not the biggest deal, but still. Love this aggression from the Jade Dragons. Seems to be working out for him. Again, that Gold Fury ends up going the way of the Styx Frame, and besides that, the aggression throughout the map. Two Tier 1 towers going down. Yeah, that's going to benefit the Jade Dragons heavily. And just as quickly as it started to rise for the Ferryman, it falls dramatically. Oni Fury is going to be coming up in about 40 seconds. So maybe a little heat check one more time for the Dragons when that comes around. 6-2 to two for the kills. Very similar, I think, to, to the last game where the fights are going their favor. They just have to make sure that the objectives align. And you had mentioned it, Charlie, but two Tier 2s in the blink of an eye. I mean, that opens up a lot more pressure on the map than you would anticipate immediately. Beads are online for Sino now, though, so maybe a little bit of change when it comes to the jungle, at least in terms of survivability. Well, that is something that he needed. Because Can he even walk? If he beads, if you dunk wall, yep. 
is there even enough, I guess, like, damage-wise? Like, at that point, you're just sealed into the fight. You're not walking away from it. You've got to turn around and get something going, even if you have to pop your beads. Yeah, Sino can drop ult on him, and as long as he's relatively even, that'll be a good trade. The issue becomes you don't have beads, you can't do that. Aurora steps forward. This is another Fury attempt from the Jade Dragons, but Sino's here. This but, time? Yeah, that's going to be it. They play it smart. <laughs> that is say. exactly how you play that. You either say, hey, now that Sino has arrived, we are W-keying. Or they say, oh boy, there's an E-set. Let's get out. And I think in this case, they didn't really have a, a, a position to do so. Baskin and Nika made the rotations in. Wait for your solo laner before you decide to go in for that pull yeah. or that fight. Patience works out well. It might be working out even better. The dragon's kind of scattered. A little bit of farm, a little bit of fight. Maybe indecisive. Stun. And damage onto Mike. But it's going to be the landfall pulls into great play from Aurora. Lasper caught out, taking a lot of damage, trying to fight Paul, but Paul just crushing waves and crushes him down. Mike's gone as well, so a 3v5 stun onto Dardes and an easy follow up for the rest of the ferryman. 5v1, double for the mid laner. And it started 0 3. He has gone 3 0 and 1 since then. The ferryman. Win the fight, get the Fury. Yeah, confusing plays there for the Jade Dragons. Lasbra should never be within melee range of Paul unless he ulted there. He just hammered in, used beads, used Aegis. Paul said, okay, I'm not going to throw any of my damage into those relics. And then ends up ulting, just deleting him off the map before he can even go anywhere. Dardes gets shut down, giving that shutdown kill to Paul, which I spoke of before. Could be very dangerous depending on who gets He's it. He's up two levels now. He's up two levels now. That's exactly right. He just is going to be a, a looming threat through the rest of the game. Baskin is here, wants to try to go for a steal, but it looks like he's scared off, so the Jade Dragons are going to get the Pyromancer at least. All the while, Cyclone Spin grabs a tier one over on left. What a swing in favor of the Ferryman. That didn't seem like it needed to happen. It was just a poorly played fight there from the Jade Dragons. The experience, that's the one I think to keep your eyes on. It was relatively even gold. I mean, 17 minutes in, 1,000 isn't a great degree of separation. But going from two levels down to two levels up for Paul, two levels up for Aurora, two levels up for Baskin. The Dragons. Great start. Now two Furies have fumbled that lead. And if you're looking at the Ferryman, Charlie, <laughs> I love the horizon for him, man. You've got really good damage. You've got really good secure, like... Uh, you don't need to go for an early fire giant just for the hell of it, but you could if you really wanted to. I mean, what are the dragons going to do into a, a fight like that? My guess is Lazbra is trying to find Paul once again because he got his beads down in that last engagement. He picked up the red buff from Dardes, and based on his positioning, he went to the oracles. He sort of sat around for a bit. He went for a speed buff. Now he's back near those oracles. He wants to see a Hebo in mid lane without beads in the next 30 seconds. I don't think Paul's going to give him that opportunity. But that seems to be the play call for now. Try and make use of this this big threat in the mid lane. And it looks like Lazar might have missed the opportunity. 20 seconds and Paul is still at a tier 2 tower. He's just not going to let it slide. I like the play call. With the red buff, you will be 100 0 in Paul if you land that ultimate. And he doesn't pre ult it himself. But missed opportunity. Paul plays it as safe as possible. And now the six fragment are rotating out. Both ADCs are not in lane. Cyclone spins towards mid at the moment. So maybe a possible look towards Fire Giant, or at the very least some pressure towards PBM, trying to catch him out in the jungle. Yeah, stunned off. He will have the double dash from Terra. Meets Nika under the Tier 1 tower on right. Stays alive. Stays standing. No Pyromancers up. Nika hit with the hook. But not enough here, Trelly. Fire Giants, the only objective over here to really be fighting over that, or, or maybe the Tier 1 if they want to go for it. They're going to stack up, the Ferryman that is, over on the right-hand side of the map, knock down the Bastions, start to get aggressive, force the Dragons into an awkward spot. It's a 3-2 split for the Dragons. They won't defend this tower. Roar. This is worth for the Dragons. Get behind them, the Dragons might be able to get a Tier 2 off of that with Lasber and Vote. And that's absolutely worth it. Tier 1 for a free Tier 2. The six Fabian are staying grouped. The Jade Dragons are splitting up. They know the Fabian weren't going for a Fire Giant pull. 
They also knew that Bastion's teleport wasn't up, so that's as free as it gets. Steal away some jumble in the process. Lazarus says, hey, your purple buff, your chest camp, those also belong to me. So that ends up being pretty beneficial for the Jade Dragons. As the Gold Fury spawns in here shortly, I would say that Sino going that Stone of Binding is still doing a good bit of damage and is still a threat towards these objectives, but Paul has become a bit of a bigger threat. You know, the crushing wave is instant. You don't have to wait for it to pop. It's just, can Paul step up? Can he get close enough to try and defend or try and use that ultimate? Whereas Sino, of course, he's got the blink. He can stay further away until it gets low. We've already seen him steal away the Gold Fury once. That's got to be looming in the background of the Jade Dragon. Hey, maybe we go for the pull, but we have to find Sino. Or maybe we go for something aggressive. We just pull beads, give Lasbra a chance to ult in. Those are the kind of plays that they have to make here. It's not as simple as let's just walk up, pull, see what happens. With two big burst mages in play, you got to know where they are at all times if you're the Jade Dragons. Well, they have a Runic Bomb in pocket. An exposed Phoenix, which always feels great. 11 kills up on the board total. 6-5 to five for the Dragons. Jelly in a very interesting position going forward. Pyromancer started up. Aurora and Baskin are here, not going to be able to do anything in time. The rest of the ferrymen on the Gold Fury, they're going to secure that one no problem. Audio cue for the Dragons gets to determine where they go, maybe for a cutoff path. Maybe for something a little bit more. Mike's leading the way, two Runic Bombs in pocket. Maybe just trying to figure out if the ferrymen think they can and will defend. They will. Now Aurora's alone. Could be some good CC chains right here. Damage is there, pushed against the wall. Has to use the dash, goes for the stun onto Vote. Vote immediately has to run away. Baskin's chasing him down. Lazbra goes up into the air, but Vote is gone. Where are you going to land if you're the Thor? Looks like the call is to fall back. And you lose your carry, and the chase is on for the Ferryman. Double shot from Cyclone Spin. Baskin with a good Fearless on the Thor. Gets both relics. Keeps the fight going. Aurora leads the way. Sino just off the mark with the stun. That seems to be enough with the tower there and the relic burn for the ferryman to fall back. But Shelly, it's not back to base. It's over to the FG. As it should be. Crushing wave and circle protection are available. The Jade Dragons do have threat here. Remember, they still do have two runic bombs. They will be able to grab this Phoenix for absolute free unless Baskin decides to teleport in. He's trying to make it over in time. The question is, does it matter? If those runic bombs get dropped, yeah, that Phoenix should be dropping for free here. And now... Will the Jade Dragons be able to get out, or will they get cut off? The Styx Ferrymen are on the way, and it looks like Mika had to stay back and try and finish the job. Darius is fast, but so is Baskin. And needs a little healing. Lazarus there. Should be enough to cause some peel. Might actually have caused some trouble for Mike. Mika's low, but it's still Hercules. And we were talking about the breastplate, breastplate of I don't think he knows Paul's there. Unfortunately, he doesn't. Misses the stun as well. Knock up, good. Paul has the damage, gets the kill. Phoenix for fire and for Nika. And presumably a little more. Mike's going to run away from this one. Stun actually off the mark. Baskin has to fall back, though, because the Tier 2 and Ferryman find themselves in a pretty advantageous position, able to start pushing down mid, pushing down left, maybe trying to respond in kind to the Phoenix that was taken. Yep, and if they grab that, that would equalize these fire minions, and they would not have to worry. Nika has gone for 15 seconds, and now six fragments siege four. They don't have an easy engage, and Mike is already going to the back line, and here comes Lasbra. Dardes gets pushed around. Lasbra gone. <laughs> just deleted, man, and so is Dardes. Two left standing, and Mike doesn't have long for his life. Snipes are coming down from vote, but it's not going to create a lot of space with this amount of death. I mean, it's four man gone. It's a fire giant. It's a phoenix, and it might just be game three. Marching forward for the ferryman, all five strong. Nika pulled in, and Nika's health bar shredded, melted. He makes it back to the fountain, but again, at what cost should be the titan? Circle of protection dropped. The healing will be there. The damage to boot, and the ferryman pushes to at least four. You start Paul off 0-3 and he ends 6-3. and three. This is a pick that can be very dangerous if played properly and Paul shows exactly why. Those fire giant fights, I, I love the call to go for the Phoenix, but unfortunately they weren't able to make it out. Nika didn't take the right pathing, runs into Paul. Yeah. And you just stagger those death timers. Even with Lasper going to the back line and finding a nice ultimate, he's got CC chain and, and instantly deleted. There just wasn't too many answers, which is surprising again because there was nothing but answers in the early game. 
It's still a ticking time bomb. If you let Evo get online, Paul will be able to control the game. Well, that start needs to be talked about, right? 3-0 in mid, you're bullying Paul yep. as hard as you can bully a Hebo. And then one fumbled fight around a Fury leads to an equal Paul, and then the next fumbled fight around the Fury leads to a two levels up Paul. Uh, and suddenly there's there's ca catastrophe all around. I mean, yep. it seems like Cyclone's having a good day. Good plays from your supports and just too much damage to deal with there. Unfortunately for the Dragons, they're not going to close this one out 3-0, but they're still on set point. We'll see how the Ferrymen respond right after this.
pulling me closer, but don't waste your time. Don't have any time for all your empty lies. I used to think that you were only mine, but I was blinded by a shallow light. I'll call your friends up. Advanced GG, you too can pick up your own God Slayer bundle by going to Advanced GG and then using code SMITE to get 10% off our great bundle of the God Slayer, whether that be the Ice Shaker, the Energy, or any of the other great products that Advanced GG has to offer. You can use code SMITE, get 10% off your entire order. They got your, the God Slayer stuff all available right now in their store. Thank you so much for Advanced GG for joining us in Season 10 of the Smite Pro League, so make sure that you go and pick up everything that you want to get from them right here and right now. Mifflin, game number three. Talked about how you need to get some objective play early in the game for the Six Ferrymen. Not really focus too much on the fights. They tried to do their best not to. Paul, unfortunately, the receiving end of a lot of aggression in the early game starts off 0-3. This game ends 6-3 and to, to get to the end of the stages of that one. The Six Ferrymen really able to help facilitate Paul, get him back into the game, get those objectives, and find a win in Game 3. And, and I'm glad you bring up that early phase because 0-3 to 3-0 and against Dardes and, like, maybe 500 gold between the two of them, maybe a level max, half a level at times. The Jade Dragons get their kills. It's just establishing something off of it that they really struggled with. And then eventually we got to the point where Paul was going to Hebo you. And if Paul's Heboing at his best, he's going to do it to all of you. I saw two or three dunks from Lazra just barely off the mark. And then, yeah, that happens. It happens in the, the last Phoenix defense. It happened around the Fire Giant fights as well. The Six Famine, the adaptations in putting Paul in a hyper carry, I think just about the majority of it here for them. Jay Dragons, on the other hand, I'm thinking this this healer composition with the Hell maybe uh, a bit suspect at least in this set, a zero percent win rate for Hell herself. Maybe something we want to look elsewhere for going forward. Otherwise, Six Ferryman, really good job uh, of pushing the lead once they had it. Felt like the Jade Dragons were never allowed to regroup once the the pendulum started to swing in favor of the Six Ferryman. It was constant grouping as five, utilizing circle protection to run down these objectives, controlling the fire giant, controlling the neutrals, and, and then a lot of heavy lifting from Sino, maybe not in damage, certainly not in damage, absolutely not in damage, but in peel. He was silencing for Paul. A couple of those stuns were connecting. He's doing at least 300 more damage than Lazbra on the other side. Jungler is a bit absent in the damage pool this time around, but... That's not what you drafted the E set for. At least that's I don't think that's what you draft the E set jungle for in my seven years competitive smite. Uh, I never did it, but when I see it, I imagine it's for facilitation and Sino's got it. Yeah, I mean you, when you see E set and we talk about it all the time here on the desk and the cast is when you draft E set, you're there to secure, kill an objective, and then move on, get a little bit of peel out there, whether it be the spirit ball with those kind of silences out there and Sino doing just that. Here in game number three and now netting the six ferrymen a second life and a second win more than anything in this best of five because now they've got to do not just game three's win now they got to repeat that for game four and then inevitably game five if they can find a win 
in game four as well. Jade Dragons, though, still have a little bit of time to play with. Still can find themselves possibly able to win here in game number four and try and end this one out here. We can jump into the picks and bans for game number four and see what changeups do get made. I got to agree with you, though. The hell has not been super promising for either team. Paul going a little bit more defensive heavy. Hasn't quite had the damage numbers out there. Dart is even though slanting very heavy in defense, just did not maybe have the peel around him, didn't have the damage output. You have to get so close sometimes to that hell, too, to really get your burst damage off. And if you're getting he close against something like a Hebo, well, you're probably dead at that point. Agreed. So the Jade Dragon say, well, if I can't get close to him, I guess I won't let him have it. Ban out the Hebo, and I think a smart adaptation. The Sticks Raymond look much better when Paul's allowed to be one of your primary damage dealers and kill secures. So we'll have to look a bit deeper into the God Pool as two of his signatures have been taken away. Hell, likely going to make her way through the first phase of picks and bans. Nemesis has been a continued adaptation now up against the Jade Dragons. It seems to be one of Lazarus' highest performing picks as of recently. And so the Styx Famine will not allow him to take that for themselves. What does that leave available in a first pick position? You've got just about choice of field on Warriors. And maybe the warrior that we had expected to never see again, the Vamana, wow. makes his way through. Good luck to Paul. If you're the win condition, man, I don't think there's a mage I'd want to play into Vamana. Colossal Fury plus W plus M1. And you are playing just like your favorite pros that are out there at home in your ranked games. Let me tell you what. Get a hastened. You might be doing it better than some of them. He is going to stick to that back line indefinitely. Well... Six Fairmen are going to try and prove that Hell deserves at least one win in this set. They'll draft alongside Hachiman on the side of the Six Fairmen. But got also note in there, remember the Jade Dragon, some of their wins in the set yesterday did come from a Vamana Yamoja Sirket comp. Obviously, cannot draft the Yamoja, and Sirket has been widely absent throughout this set. Maybe a gentleman's agreement or something between these two junglers saying, you know what, why don't we just not play the Sir Ket today? Because I, I, I'll i be honest with you, I don't understand what happened to Sir Ket over the course of uh, not even 24 hours. Yeah, I, I asked the brighter minds that are hovering around the studios, some of the pro players, previous coaches, some world champions, and they said to me, you know, Sir Ket got triple nerfed, right? And I was like, yeah, that was a while ago. She was dominating the first couple days of this event, wasn't she? And she was. Gonna go unpicked here once more, it would seem. Shibalanke for the Jade Dragons to round out their top three tier on the other side for the Ferryman. I want what is the answer? Maybe a Geb? How do you peel of a mana? Make them too tanky to kill? Geb could do it. Revive? Yeah, you can kill him. Gotta do it twice. Hopefully your ult lasts long enough. Maybe that's it. Seems to me the answer generally has been just dealing with a mana immediately. I I know. Hitting Vamana makes the ultimate last longer. That's not exactly ideal, but we've been seeing very squishy builds out of Vamana so that he's been allowed to actually deal the damage in the back line. Double Hunter drafts have always been pretty good into him. Gods with Defense Shred, always really good as well. Nemesis used to be one of those standard answers, but the Six Fairman have taken it away already by banding it out. Where does that leave us? What is the answer? What is the ideal pick here for the Ferryman? To address Vamana in particular. And I and I know the fans at home, and if you haven't been watching the meta recently, why is he thinking so hard about how to beat one god? Why is he thinking so hard about how to beat the solo laner, if anything? You know, so solo seems like everything down. Yeah, it seems like solo isn't the most impactful role in the current meta. It is when Vamana is playing, alright? When Vamana's on the map, that's the problem. That's the guy you gotta address. Consistent damage, maybe? What mid uh, a safe mid lane pick? Early. Maybe just put him on, like, Thoth so he could dash, like, across the lane to get away from him. I, I couldn't say. Merlin Fire Stance, maybe? But we already have the but, Hell locked in. So yeah, if you want well, Hell support? No. No, no you not don't. entirely. Here's a wild one. Maybe one we haven't seen in a while. What do you think about maybe, like, a Kali? Someone who can just get constant auto attacks in there, get that kin size procs in there, maybe build a little bit of crit to, to slam through. Crazy auto attack chain. I don't know. I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to think out in the wild at this point here. Yeah, kin size plus vital amplifier. Kali, just stick to him. That could be it. Sino is a Kali player. That, that could be a option. Sunder, of course. Erosion. You're gonna want all that, and you're gonna need some more as well. God. Nobody's figured out an answer to the Vamana. Well, no. the Vamana. Nobody's done it. Their we're, answer we're, has we're, been, we ban it, so we don't have to figure yeah. out an actual answer to it at this point. Often it's, hey, lose game one of Vamana, don't see it again. This time he sneaks his way in to game four of this set. Couldn't say. Could not say. And if I could say, I'd be coaching. I wouldn't be here. Well, we'll have to see if the Six Fairmen do have an answer to the Vamana here in game number four. Their bans, though, are focused a little bit more towards Dardis, though. 
will be Baron and the Hera taken off the table. Jade Dragons will take away Eset and Ares. And for the first time in a while, the Ganesh was open, but not taken by the Six Baron. It was the Terra instead now for Aurora. So that does confirm that this Hell will be going over to the mid lane for Paul once more, determined to find a win in that column for himself because so far in this turn, the two games that he has played, it has come up as goose eggs, at least for the ferryman in the win column. Now to the Jade Dragons. They've got Vimana, they've got Horus, they've got their frontliners, you got your carry, still waiting on what Dart is and even what Lazbra's going to go for. It's wild that not even, again, 24 hours ago, Cat was a top pick, top ban for just about every single game that we were playing, but has now gone completely absent in the set. And doesn't it seem like it'd be just a good pick here? Right. Jade Dragons, doesn't it just seem like it with a Hell on the other side or a Tear who's going to sustain or a Terra who's going to do the exact same? Instead, it's the Pele, nope. who is good at pressuring Hell in particular, can match the dive of a Moana. You've got a whole lot of mobility. Beautiful. And now you've got two Vamanas. Wow. Ooh. This is like OG Tuthulu, Cthulhu. Vamana's got, we got to get a, a cute name for Vamana Morgan combo. Tamana? Two Mana? Yeah, we'll. we'll Look, we'll workshop it after we'll, the We'll desk. figure something out. We'll, we'll, we'll cook something up. Maybe somebody in chat or on Twitter will give us a good suggestion for this one. Hunbat's being hovered for the Ferryman. And we've gone on a record in the past saying how good Sinos Hunbat's has looked for the Six Ferryman to try and find them some wins. But giving over the option of that to a Morgan never feels that great, but feels like having that extra bit of AoE CC for the Six Ferryman could be great for follow-up, but not going to go that way instead. You're nuts if he locks us in, J-Mac. You're actually nuts for calling this. And I swear I did not talk to him at all before this. I walked straight from the green room to here. I think the only player I've talked with, well, I talked a little bit with the Kings and, and, the, and the Leviathans out there, at least on the way back in, but Kali Hubbard for the Ferryman straight away. Okay. I can't let you have it. Nah, I can't have anything, man. Fenrir, though, for the six Ferryman rounds out their comp. Really good into Shibalanke. Shibalanke no longer has the option of, you know, waiting out his ultimate, then using dash to stop Brutalize with the stun because Darkest of Nice no longer stuns. So you now have no counterplay into Fenrir Bar and kill him faster than he kills you. And in the early game, that's not exactly an option. Decent matchup into the Pele as well. Uh, doesn't necessarily bring a whole lot of threat to the frontliners, the Jade Dragons. If you can catch the Morgan pre transformation, maybe you can get things done with like a Hydra's Lament or something along those lines. Uh, go for a burst style of build here. For the Vamana, anytime or for the for the Fenrir, excuse me. Anytime you can deal damage to the Morrigan pre-transformation is just ideal, especially if you're projecting a tank transformation because you keep uh, the percentage HP over post-transformation. So deal with the Morrigan in the back line, then you only got one Vamana to work through, which has been tough for just about everybody, but it's better than two. Notably, Fenrir has been a pick that has worked for Sino, at least the one time that he has played it during. The regular season phase. Single game played, 100% win rate, 3.5 on the KDA for him that time through. A lot of AoE control, though, at least here out of the six Fairman. You got the Terra with the Monolith, you got the wall out there trying to catch out a target or two. Tier, if in that defensive stance, can have some ways to maybe utilize those burn speeds or maybe even burn those speeds so that way this Fenrir can get through. Is this a composition now around the hell? Because I feel like we have to keep pivoting to that point. Is this a comp around the hell that can still? work for the six ferryman to fight up against the jade dragons so with hell especially with paul's build which is either going to have one two or maybe even at times three defense items the concern is where is your damage coming from hachiman and fenrir have got it it's here to a certain extent should be able to facilitate that as well earthen fury a phenomenal disengage tool also just good at bursting uh the enemies or adding additional burst onto your own so i think there is enough damage here with the ferryman uh, and, and it maybe is a failing on me as an analyst uh, to ha struggle so much. I'm blinded by double Vamana right now. I, uh, beat it early, maybe? Win before it happens? I don't know. It, it, just seems, it just seems pretty good here for the Jade Dragons. I mean, there's a reason why the Vamana has been top pick, top banned throughout the entirety of this tournament, throughout the latter portion of at least the regular phase. It's because not a whole lot of teams have figured out a full way to deal with this solo lane Vamana even despite some of the nerfs that have been coming their way. So for the six Ferrymen, have got to see if they've got the answer to it. Maybe it is just win out early and make this Vimana 
at least a non-factor for them. And again, the Six Fairmen have got to win game number four if they want to try and extend the set again to game number five and try and win out this best of five set. J Dragons, they've just got to win in here if they want to close this one out and take that third seed spot. Can the J Dragons do it? Can the Six Fairmen stop this Vamon and extend it to game five? Well, let's jump right into game number four. Thanks so much, J Mac and Mifflin. That's right, game four. And the Ferryman back still against the wall. It's Gore, it's Trelly, and Doug. For Trelly, it could be the last time. It might not be the last time. There was a lot of talk about a little bit of that <laughs> that lack of Sir Ket, but a lot about that Vimana and what has been interesting to watch this. You remember it was 50-50? It's slowly creeped higher and higher every time for the Dragons. It certainly has. And given the last game... You'd think maybe a little bit more credit would be given to the Ferryman, but Paul doesn't get his Hebo this time around. He gets the Hell. He's already lost on it. So maybe that's the reason that Twitch chat doesn't have that, that amount of faith in the Sticks Ferryman here. But I do like the draft the Jade Dragons have for themselves, of course. Anything with Vamana on it, I'm going to give a little bit of a of a star. But match that with... Lasper on the Pele I picked that he's been very dynamic on, and Dardes on the Morgan, who can transform into either one of those picks, the, the Vamana or the Pele. And that's going to be a great start for your team fight. I am curious to see how Sino elects to play this Fenrir. Could get aggressive, could jump in pretty early on, try and put pressure onto just about anyone. Lasper yeah. specifically doesn't have any way to interrupt that Brutalize, so could be annoying to try and deal with it. And I think Sino is due for one of those pop-off games, you know, where he where he is controlling the map and he starts swinging early on and continues. Last game was fine, a relatively quiet performance, but ended up stealing a very pivotal Gold Fury and then sort of just did his job as he set. But hasn't been that that top frag, top of the scoreboard in a bit. And I'm thinking, you know, could be, could be due for a performance like that. Well, it's a lot of damage, but like you said, I'm keeping my eyes on the early game. I will have to give him credit. You know, when I was looking at the Morgan, when they were hovering the Hunbats, it felt like, oh no, wait, now for Dardes, there's actually a couple of people he might want to transform into. Fenrir's maybe not as high on the list as Vomana, especially given what we've seen. This lane, and I guess this matchup specifically, Baskin right on the tier, Nika on, on Vomana, probably nothing to, to be... Nothing to get excited about over the next few minutes, but when they do start to rotate in, I feel like just the presence we've been seeing from Vamanas lately is, is, I can't think of a better word for it other than oppressive, right? I mean, a lot of the times, that, you know, we've seen Baskin talked a lot about that. We've seen it even when it's not getting a lot of the kills. It just seems like it is so stifling to play against. It is, and I think Paul in particular is going to have to build a specific way to try and not just get stomped on by Nika. You know, the breastplate of regrowth is going to be a must. You have to try and outrun him. If he gets hastened, it's not easy, especially with that wing chart. I mean, by the time you get hastened, usually your wing chart's gone. But I'm thinking that's going to be Nika's sole duty. He's going to be on hell duty. That's it. Like, just run down hell, build it up movement speed, whether that's through Talisman, Hasten, Golden Blade, whatever you need to be able to run down Paul at any given moment. That is his only opportunity. Not to say that Lazarus can't do it as well. I think that Pele has some great damage with the Brawler's Beat Stick. Could just look to try and focus out this hell. But it just becomes a lot easier because of how immobile uh, that this mid lane mage can be for, for a Vamana to be able to do it. Always love those. I'm going to call it a support moment where Mike dumps his entire kit into a roar. Doesn't have a lot, but he does have Dardes now, and a roar is too deep. The double dash and the root is going to be enough to get away. Secured green buff for the dragons. Just shy of getting that first blood. It's funny because last game, Mike was on that green buff duty <laughs> on the Terra, looking for Paul. But this time around, Aurora says, hey, I can do that too. I'm going to look at that green buff constantly. Doesn't end up getting anything out of it, but still, put some damage. And uh, I believe stole the minis away, so yeah. that is something. A little bit of experience sprinkled on top of a nuisance. And I, 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 would, I think when you steal it away, it should... Count is a double, because you don't get the same amount. You get less for invading, but you also deny it from the enemy team. Yeah. So that helps you out a little bit more. I think Aurora's fine with a trade like that. But Dardis has been getting consistently poked out from Paul. The Morgan, not so much known for her poke potential. It is a lot of all in. Hey, I hit you with my Dark Omen. I'm going in. I'm turning into something. 
And honestly, Fenrir is not a bad call if you're specifically trying to kill Paul. Because he doesn't have a he has got Aegis, he doesn't have beads. You could easily pick him up, pull yeah. him under tower, and there's again nothing to cancel brutalize. But Lazra is also a great option. I mean both I of these assassins for ask. now. We've seen a lot of double Pele. Yeah, I love the double Pele. And sometimes you just get smacked by two Pele ults at once. And there's not a lot you can do after that amount of damage. The issue with the Morgan, which isn't really an issue, but if you don't play her often, you usually want to have two different transformations hotkeyed. One, that is, hey, I, I need to get out. I need to, to survive. And the other is, I need to go in. So I would imagine Dardes sits on his, his safe one until it's time to go in. Like He might be constantly on Vimana, until he's like, oh, now it's time for me to go quickly switch over to, to Pele or, or to Fenrir in this case. Make sure you click it twice and then just go in. Like that, That's usually the, the order of operations for piloting a Morgan. Uh, the Morgan. Annoying very, to say, yeah, but very, I had very, to make sure I made the that's distinction. A, a very important to see, distinction. Yep. There's someone out there named Morgan who's just, they're, they're not. They can't do any of the things I just yeah. said. <laughs> <laughs> they're just hanging out. And that seems to be the pace of this game. Just hanging out a little bit. 300 gold, 400 gold separating them. Not too much to write home about. That first blood bounty simultaneously feels like it means a lot because of how much of a burst it can give you and very little the longer the game goes that it doesn't have it. Only five and a half minutes in. So nothing too stressful. And it feels like Sino is going to be the one... You know, we always talk about Fenrir's, some of the struggles, some of the times. Actually, this week we've seen Fenrir where he just doesn't have anybody burning beads for him and would struggle with that. But Aurora, at the minimum, can at least bully people or follow up. If Sino bites somebody, there's going to be some CC chains. But the supports, I mean, Aurora had rotated over for green. You'd seen Mike kind of fighting off in the jungle. Seemed to be going right back to lane. Nobody's really looking for that blood just yet. And as you had mentioned, it feels like we have yet to determine what kind of game from Sino this is going to be. So far, we haven't really determined much at all from this yeah, game. Really, it has been a lot of just farming. It is game. I mean, just match point here for the Jade Dragons, and of course, the Ferryman finally have an opportunity to get aggressive. It looks like trying to find a Ragnarok. But there's no CC immune targets, and Sino is just going to walk away. Beautiful up by Mike. He doesn't have beads. He knows, hey, if I get stunned, I'm going to die. Might as well pre ult and vote says, you're not ulting me. So uh, a failed gank, but at the very least, you get Mike's ultimate out of it, and Sino didn't use anything. He just jumped in. So I wouldn't call it necessarily a failure. You're happy with getting to the skies, but how many times have you seen a Horus hold before, like, 12 minutes? It's usually not the case. He uses a lot of his stuns and, and movement, and that ultimate sits on cooldown for a while. Yeah. Now that it's on cooldown, Shelly, they're not even going to get a Phoenix here. That's, I can't believe it. Yeah, that's ridiculous. He's not going to ult in the fire minions or nothing. <laughs> <laughs> nothing really to worry about there for the dragons. And like you said, well played. Maybe something to worry about. Sino. Oh, one more. Cycles back around, but they're under tower. The pain of being a jungler, your lane is doing too well. Going to pick up the shield buff, maybe. Go for something a little deep. Votes low. Still has the beads. With a little bit of healing for Mike. And more specifically, a whole ass tower defending him. It's going to be too difficult to try and jump in there. Lazbar Dardes hanging out in the jungle. Feels like with two Pele's, or I guess in this case, just one Pele and one the Morgan who is TBD, a fight could just break out in the middle of nowhere. They're still going to hold back the reins. Keep things a little more neutral. Mid camp suddenly becoming a little more important, right? When you don't have first blood, you're still looking at the separation of gold. Good farm for the ferryman. Has been consistent so far this set. They're up six, seven hundred gold just off of the neutral objectives. They are so far. <laughs> we, we the, the ease of farm gore. That, that's what that's what's been going on here. A lot of not potential ganks and clearing out camps as efficiently as you yeah. can. It does seem like dual lane has been a bit of a problem here for the Jade Dragons. Vote and PPM can't get much pressure. Not, not the hugest issue. Builds are exactly mirrored one stack in favor of Cyclone Spin on the dev gauntlets. But XP-wise, Vote's not quite level 9 yet. He would love to take over. 
Besides that, we're seeing relative parity throughout the entirety of this match. And I think that Sino does have the ability to get active towards Solo. Of course, Nika doesn't have the, the most mana. But the main concern, of course, is even if you pick him up and you pull him away, he's going to have Colossal Fury when he lands. And I don't think Baskin's got that 100-0 to zero capabilities on this tier just yet. So do you want to waste Ragnarok and put pressure on the right side of the map and possibly open up the door for the Jade Dragons to make a pull on a Gold Fury? Doesn't seem like the smart call to me. And Sino agrees. He's sticking over on the left side of the map. Doesn't mean he's fighting them. Nope. He attempted a gank once. Mike ulted out. He attempted a regank. Couldn't find it. And that's pretty much been it. About to be 10 minutes into the game. Mike going deep behind a roar and cyclone spin. It looks like he might have had a little bit of help and they've been further up in the lane, but Lazra, Dardes go back to mid. Paul, maybe looking for a little bit of a slow. Baskin as well, looking for a fight. There's going to be the Brutalize. It's going to be under the tier one. Knockup is good. Low health bars for both junglers. But the disengage is clean. Mike bullying Cyclone Spin alongside Vote. Autos are solid. But not enough damage between the two of them to confirm the kill just yet, Trelly, and we pass the 10-minute mark. Still find an ever-elusive first blood so far this game. Might not continue that rate. Votes low. God. Cyclone goes in. A roar picks up the kill. And just like that, they get it done. Yeah, Vote did not expect the Terra Ultimate to proc. That was a lot of damage that came through. And one kill is all it'll take for the Six Frame to open up the map and head in for a Gold Fury. It seems like the Jade Dragons are not going to be stepping up. Maybe Dardes aggresses on the Paul. But that, that's about it. That's all that's going to come through until that Pyromancer spawns in. Lazbra is waiting on respawn. But no, can't even go for that. So a free Fury going the way of the Styx Ferryman. And there's the pull. But Paul's nearby. He knows this is going on. Will he step forward is the question. Nika's on zone duty. Yeah, Paul's not going to walk forward. Once he realizes the Vamon is there, it's all on the Baskin, and he's too late to the party. Well, this is a trade we saw several times with the Dragons early in this set. Pyro for Furies. They didn't, at the time, didn't care as much about it. It wasn't fights that were going wrong. They were just going for the Pyro. This decision may be forced for them. Two levels up now for Cyclone Spin. Something you could start to leverage. You have to keep our eyes on Sino where he maybe puts some of that pressure. Let's see if it's going to be on left. Although with Gold Fury gone, doesn't seem like there's much reason to hang out over there. Charlie, we find ourselves in the spot and, and really looking towards, I'm going to say both solo laners here, because we start with some more protection, keep yourself alive items. Immediately into the Golden Blade for Vamana, not uncommon, but Transcendence pick up for Baskin, which again, not uncommon as of late. Gives them more potential to fight. And in moments like that, survivability for both of these just tanky, tanky targets. Kind of bleeds through, and you get to see it stun good onto a roar from Dardes. We haven't seen a massive or any transformation just yet. Do more Divine Ruin finished in mid. And really, it's just waiting for the other shoe to drop. Where the pressure is going to be? Lazarus seems to think it's on right. Knock up good onto Baskin. Damage is there from the ult. Needs one more hit. Finds it. Gets one on the board for the Dragons. Yep, easy gank. Baskin ulted a bit ago to clear a wave and trying to help himself get the totem. So Lazarus shows up at the perfect time, that Volcanic Lightning, as long as you're able to connect. It's going to make sure that you're going to get the damage and the value from the ultimate. And that kill goes over to Lazarus, his first of the game, and of course the first for the Jade Dragons. And that's going to net a Tier 1 tower as well, so a great time to get aggressive. Baskin won't spawn in for a bit, and he already teleported, so he might miss a good portion of that wave. Great opportunity there for Lazarus. Unfortunately for Lazarus, the Sticks Ferryman have also found a way to get aggressive, and that's over on left, but they've got a Runic Bomb. They can get some good damage, and Baskin's going to ult in and try and stop this. Unable to find the connection on the ult. Damage is there, but Paul's rotated in. Lazarus low. One more hit's all you need. And he's running away. He's getting deep. Might just do his best to die, get what he can done, but it's a Tier 2 for his life. Vomana, no mana to work with. Waiting for his dash. Doesn't have a lot to separate it. Paul's trying. Has the damage, but Missed he one. can't get it through. Didn't the minions the finds it there and punishes 
the tier two push, but it's still a lot of gold for the dragons. A lot of pressure on right. Yep. Did not have the mana. He wanted ult so bad. He, he kept stalling for it, but just didn't have a blue buff. You end up getting a tier two tower, which is a big deal. But it looks like the ferryman will be able to answer back and grab a tier one of their own. And that still is going to keep the gold pretty heavily in favor of the Sticks Ferryman. Yeah. And I think that's good map state control, of course. Like, now Baskin's a bit less safe, but it's very difficult to gank tier as is. Even with that tier 2 down, I feel like Baskin should be okay just farming up as long as he keeps his ult in available. That was the, the big difference maker the last time he got ganked. He lost his ult. Didn't have any way to close gap. Didn't have any way to run away. Ends up going down. I think now he's probably going to hold on to that ultimate just a little bit longer and picks up the mid guardian mail just to make sure that Lazbar can't run him down for free or any of these other audio auto attackers we might see, which is essentially everyone. Dardes is probably going to transform into one as well. So I think it's a good buy there from Baskin. How do you feel? I'm good. Glad to hear it. Yeah. How about <laughs> Hasten Katana? We saw it pretty early for a Vamana. I think it was yesterday. Oh my gosh, Sino. Sino's just deleted from mid. And you know what? Maybe it doesn't matter. If you're not attacking, attacking Baskin, you're still going to have the damage, still have the autos. That seems to be good for them. And Teleport as well from Nika. So maybe that conversation about what he's going to provide doesn't even matter. He's going for Paul right now, deep into the back, chasing him under the Tier 2. Autos are there. Too fast. But he's too fast. That Paul, that is. Nika, unfortunately, has to fall back. But the team's lining up for the Pyromancer. Starts the burn. Baskin there around the wall. Mike goes up into the sky. Dunk down for Baskin. Dragons. Beautiful. Get Pyro. And Mike gets him out. He says, hey, we're going for this objective and we're leaving. Vote's going to grab us a tier one tower over on left, hopefully. That's all that we should be looking for. And I, I, I understand the play from Sino. It was clear he wanted to pull beads before a primal fury pull on left, but he went way too hard if it was just to pull beads. Lasbra gets the return kill. That makes Nika teleport in, trying to run down Paul. And if he had Hazen Katana, probably would have been able to kill him. To answer your question, I love that item if you're tanky enough, but the primal fury seems to be going down here. And the Jade Dragons might be too little too late. Yeah, Ferryman picked that one up. You had mentioned it. Farm still in their favor. Almost 3,000. And if a fight goes their way as well, could have been catastrophic. 1,800 experience, so nothing too crazy there. But the gold causing a lot of difficulty for them. You can see level parity for pretty much everybody. A little bit behind for Sino. A little bit ahead for Paul. But the farm game. Is where the ferrymen are succeeding as of right now. And Trelly, we've got a few minutes before any big neutral objective comes back. And unlike last time where you, you had so much, I think, in favor, like the burst, the Hebo, you had the E-set, Fire Giant feels like a pipe dream right now. It certainly does. Just because of how slow paced this game has been, though. Any sort of big objective fight seems like we're so far away. But in reality, some level 17s coming through. Yeah. That's just Cyclone Spin. Uh, you know, everyone else sitting about 16, 15 or so. It's really just PBM who's gotten the bad end of the XP stick. They'll be fine. Uh, this Horus is still extremely safe no matter how far behind you are. That dash is on such a sh short cooldown, and he has so much movement as is. But I do think that Vote is feeling the pain of being a bit behind now. That level 15 just ticked over to 16. He would love to just split push for a bit and stick around. But Roar Dash is in. Is there no one from the Jade Dragons that wants to help? No, it seems like Dardis is on his own, and Sino is trying to help chase down as well. Or ends up finding Lazbra. He wasn't even looking for Lazbra. <laughs> he, he was trying to find the Invis Dardis and got a free stun, and now Nika yeah. is so far in the back line. Unfortunately for Nika, he gets found by Cyclone Spin. The damage is there. Aurora will get burned down. So if Nika falls, it's frontline for frontline, but Sino. And Co. appear to have dropped the chase. Paul's still on. He's still chasing. Teleport on left for Baskin. Nika avoids the slow, avoids the damage, and that is enough for Paul to pull back. Purple buff invade should be... Could have been successful, uh, but he leashes it there. Trelly, it's just the one pick. Onto a roar, still dead. Helps get Mike maybe a little closer in terms of level parity, but gives a... Open opportunity on the map for the Dragons to start playing a little more aggressively. Yep, Vote was able to get some free farm as well because Cyclone Spin rotated out to pull that ult from Nika. Catches him up to level 17 and was able to mirror the build of Cyclone for now. 
I do think that Paul has still been a menace. Nika is slowly learning that he is just slower. Which, I understand why he would go into the Shoguns if he plans on getting hastened, but if he doesn't, it does seem like Talisman would have been the better call, just trying to run him down. I think that the unfortunate truth is, no matter how much movement speed you build, if you're building three or four tank items, a regrowth hell is going to be able to outrun you, usually, if you, if you can't guarantee that slow. It's just on such a short cooldown, once you proc it, Paul's probably going to be able to run away, and if that's the case, then Lazbra and Dardes should be on hell duty, not Nika. He, he can just go run down Cyclone, spin force out that ultimate, and then double Pele. That usually deals with the hell pretty well. Usually, though. Sometimes dealing with Paul isn't usual. That is true. He can be a bit <laughs> tricky. <laughs> we'll watch. one on one for the hell right now. 002 over in the other side for Dardes. Pyromancer was started, dropped by the ferryman, picked back up, lights turned off, vote has vision alongside Nico Lasper, loops around the back, not going to find the knockup. Basket goes forward, looks for the lockdown, forces the beads out of Lasper. Sino unable to find the stun after. Won't have the pickup for the jungler, but it's 130. And Lasper's going to have to be careful here. Pyromancer still low. Trading back and forth, one hit, Ferryman secure that one, pick up onto Nika. Good for Sino, but the damage follow up, not quite there. Good from Vote to find a little bit more ult from Nika, but he's just getting shredded. Nobody seems to care about his health bar. Dardes transforms into the Vimana and seems to be suffering a similar fate. Has to go into the ult with Mike, who gets him out of there. But it's a great play for the Ferryman, lines him up, and they're going to go straight to the real prize. Fire Giant waiting for him 21 minutes in. Yep, Lazar well, was positioned in the back line, but remember he was forced out. He did not want to get brutalized by Sino because he beats early on. So he had to use that ult defensively just to try and retreat. The Jade Dragons are not going to be able to defend this one. They're going to go in for the Oni Fury, but Baskin and Aurora know exactly what play is coming. And now they're going to try and shut this one down. Baskin still has his ultimate, and it looks like just his presence alone is enough to make sure that Oni Fury doesn't drop either. Beautiful map control here from the Six Ferryman. They don't want to give the, the Jade Dragons an inch to try and come back into this game. And they are certainly not going to give them a free Oni Fury. We're seeing gold hasn't been too separate kind of plateaued for the ferryman they might lose baskin here though the damage the lockdown the ult is good but lasper's waiting they're gonna punish him for his zone can they not kill aurora there you go open up a lot aurora next target on the chopping block the other three ferrymen on the other side of the map lasper needs a little help double dash from aurora is gonna be enough to get him out of there so all the damage was ready trelly they didn't have the secure they needed to make sure Aurora stayed in combat. Only kill off Baskin. They lose a tower over on right in the meantime. Yeah, I think Lasper was the only one who knew that play was possible. Everyone else started to run away. Lasper said, wait, Nika's controlling right. He made all the carries back. There's no one else to help him. Why don't we just run this down? And of course, Aurora was able to stall until his double dash came back up and makes it out just for free. But the Jade Dragons take Fire Giant off Baskin and end up getting the Oni Fury anyways off of the price of their towers over on right, which I think is going to end up being worth it for now. Nika got picked up, does not have beads, so Sino had a very easy target, and the bad news for Nika is he's not getting much tankier. He's going to be able to upgrade his starter item, but that's about it. His last item will be a damage item, whether that's Shadow Drinker or Hastened. It's going to be some movement speed. So if he gets picked up by this Fenrir and brought back into the damage dealers of the Sticks Ferryman, even if he ults, May just be too little too late. He's going to have to watch his positioning whenever this Fenrir is around. Zero, two, and one. We don't get to see a lot of Vimana. He's still been top of the band charts. The games we have seen have really given us a good reason as to why he's top of the band charts. This one may be showing why. The ferrymen were ready to deal with it. Baskin stunned out in the jungle. Goes for the Fearless onto Mike. CCs him just enough to disengage. Get back to his team. Paul awaits with the healing. Tier 2 tower on left goes down. Fire Giant, 40 seconds left for the power play on the Ferryman. Lazarus deep, deep, deep in the jungle. Is he going to go for Phoenix with the Runic Bomb? Right now, he's setting things up. Gets the red buff. Has the Oni minions over there. Also has four Ferrymen running down at him. Let's make that five. Baskin. Cyclone. Blink ult, he's Paul out. Paul already here. He didn't blink. Can't get the blink. 
Has to use the ult. Fearless was waiting for him. Has to use the beads. But the damage is there. The damage is done. A kill for the ferryman on the jungler who's too deep, too far gone. And now 50 seconds in the penalty box. Yeah, he had to blink there. If you blink ult, he's got Erendite Brock. He should be able to zoom away. But he just ults. And of course, Baskin's able to just match that with his own blink and make sure that he gets caught out. Beautiful play by the tier on the side of the ferryman. And that's going to be a beads down. I guess and you keep up your, your blink, and you still should be able to get active at Fire Giant if your team defends. But the question becomes, will they defend? Because if not, you're not going to make it there in time. This Fire Giant will just be burned before Glassworks can even get there. But it seems like just Vote is on the left side of the map. Everyone else on the side of the Jade Dragons is within shouting distance of the Fire Giant. So have the opportunity to go in for a defense. But so far... It seems like Aurora has been a real big nuisance to the front, the backline of the Jade Dragons. He's been stepping forward, only dying once, uh, setting up a lot of CC, sort of just making sure that the carries on the side of the Ferryman can just free cast effectively. That's what Paul's been up to, just throwing down some poke, zooming across the map, and keeping Cyclone Spin nice and healed up. And if Aurora keeps going to the backline like that, and they don't have the DPS to shred through him, Seems like a pretty easy strat for the Jade Dragons to continue, and here he goes again. Just walk forward. Aurora is W keying this game. There's pings on to Nika. Just to point out, Milana was there. Fire Giants respawned in. Still four and a half shy of being enhanced. One tier two left standing for the Dragons, two left standing for the Ferryman. Both mid tier twos available, and then the tier two and left over there for the Ferryman still standing. So Phoenix is exposed on either side. Fire Giant half health. Mike steps forward. Vision in favor of the ferryman. Sino great goes for jukes. the ult. Can't get anyone. Like you say, great jukes. And that might be enough to stall out a lot from the ferryman. They lose a ton of fight potential. Yep. Fracture the jump and dash the ult. BBM gets out for free. And now actually stepping forward. That's Sino's ultimate. And that, that was the big concern. I think, you know, Nika got pulled back in pretty easily. Mike, same sort of play could have happened if the Ragnarok comes through. But because it's down... And the Jade Dragons have an opportunity to make a play or just sit here and do nothing. That seems to be the call for now. But if Sino's ultimate comes back up, you've wasted your opportunity. Or at the very least, you could have gotten some farm. It seems like they are going to make a pull here. There is some ward coverage on the Fire Giant. And Aurora actually goes for a wraparound. And here comes Baskin as well, blinking on a vote. Fire Giant was the main call, but Cyclone... Seems to be the auxiliary pick up. Good autos from Lazbra. And he gets back there. He's got Paul locked down as well. The yeah. autos are there. The damage is good. He almost falls, but it does not matter. Double kill for the jungler, for the dragons. Now the engage is there. The front line is going to crumble next. Roar seems to be the main target. Vote throws out his DPS. Couple of dashes from Aurora. Buy some time. Mike. He's so Mika, fast. Super far back dealing with Baskin. Zone him out. Should... Question mark. Find the Terra here at some point. But Aurora <laughs> is slowing people down. Speed instead of help. <laughs> That's bro. It doesn't even need his help for Dardes. They get the kill. They stagger him out. Four gone on the ferryman. And the fire giant to boot going to all five of the Jade Dragons. Yep, incredible play from Lazra. He forces out the ultimate from Cyclone Spin. And is able to chase down. The Hachiman, who unfortunately goes right to hell and says, hey, maybe Paul can save me. Paul says, nope, sorry, I can't. Oh, by the way, you brought him to me? And, of course, Last was able to win that trade as well. Hell's got great range, but once you close that gap and get right next to her, even with an Aegis and a Beads, the Hell's not going to be able to live that. Lasper has been the highlight of this Jade Dragon squad for the entirety of this set. And I think a play like that is going to continue to put the Dragons in the driver's seat. One more tier two on the left that they have to go through, but they're going to grab the Primal Fury and head on back to base. They still have some more build changes to go through. Last one actually goes, he was going into Heartseeker, ends up selling it for Magi, so maybe just fearing Sino or how much CC is on the side of the Sticks Ferryman. But now he's essentially full build and has to work on just getting three K pots, things like that. And I think. Dardes has the opportunity to turn into a, a, a Pele and do the same thing. He has been going to Vamana, and that's all fun. Double big babies, a fun time. But if you're trying to delete carries, no one's doing it better than Pele right now. 6-2-1. and one. A lot of level 20s in the game, 28 minutes in. 
And yet to be seen maybe more of what this fire giant can do for him. A minute and a half left on the power play, so... Not a lot of time to work with. Charlie, they've opened up a little more of the map, right? You get yourselves an Oni Fury. And maybe more importantly, a Tier 2. It lo looks to be a second one coming here shortly. Farm, gold, discussions we've been having for a few minutes, at least in favor of the ferryman. Now, finally, not only in favor of the dragons, but pretty firmly in their control. A minute left to try and break a Phoenix. One Runic Bomb on either side. Sino's going to jump in, grabs Mike, pulls him right through the doors. So his team is waiting. And the support for the dragons gone. As simple as that. And that dream, at least of the Phoenixes, dies with Mike. Beautiful setup. I mean, the six servants sit there by the door. They say, hey, there's two guys without beads. Bring us one of them. And he said, all right, <laughs> I found Mike. Able to bring him back. And, of course, Baskin is there for the chain stun just to make sure that Mike couldn't dash to the waiting arms of his team. And I would say that's the end of this Fire Giant Siege here for the J-Dragons. Put them slightly ahead gold-wise. But still, you're not losing map state. You didn't break the base. The Phoenixes are still all up. The Sticks Ferryman should be pretty happy with how this turned out. Because the fight beforehand was disastrous, right? The, the actual Fire Giant fight, they really weren't able to do anything. I think Lasper just sort of tore up the back line. And from that, the fight was over. They've got one more chance. And now the question becomes, is Aurora going to stand as far front as he did in the last fight? Because Baskin and Aurora have been diving. And if that's the case, who's on Lazbra duty? Who is peeling? It can't be Sino anymore, because he's got Magi's and Beads. I'm thinking either Aurora has to stay back with Paul, or they all have to dive together. Because if the fight's that split, and you have let, just one Pele or one Vamana getting to the back line, that could be disastrous. But if all three get to the back line, that could be an enhanced fire giant going the way of the dragons. Now at any given time, the people who are giving you the most trouble just be a second one. Now that's kind of what we've been watching. Dardes, 1-0 and 6, so maybe not as flashy as Lazbra, but unanswered so far. And with a full build finished for Nika, you have to imagine some fun on the horizon for the dragons assuming the fight can go well. 10 seconds left, Fire Giant will spawn in. It's going to be enhanced. And beginning right now are the Ward Wars. Trying to create some vision, but more so strip it from the Ferryman. Keep Lazver safe. And maybe open up the opportunity for Dardas to go for something. Gets the stun onto Baskin. Has a lot of damage behind him. But they're just going for the zone. Fire Giant going to get dropped. The Dragons... Dance around. Lazbra and Nika are over in mid. They've got two runic bombs. If they're let alone, they'll grab that Phoenix for sure. Similar to what they did last game, right? I mean, you just walk up, drop a bomb or two, and be done with it in the blink of an eye. Vote has the damage for a fire giant. It's going to be started up. That's what the dragons are trying to force here, Trelly. See if they can get a bite from the ferryman. Baskin standing forward. Aurora holding W. Separated is the fight, something you didn't want to see. Sino going around the corner. Dardes looks deep. And has made his transformation. Fire Giant goes the way of the Dragons. And now it's whether or not they can pick up the fight afterward. Enhanced. Beautiful Already. Wall. And then a great wall locks in. Sino gets the kill over to Dardes. And the chase is going to be on Nika. Up into the Colossal Fury. Chasing down Cyclone. And Aurora has the damage to find it. Wow. It's only going to find you so much here. They get under the right side. Phoenix vote. Taking a little time to get here. Lazarus low. Paul is gone. Aegis buys a lot of time, but Dardes still finds the shot, and that's what's needed. Right side Phoenix goes down, and with the front line left standing, the ferrymen have to stop an onslaught of all five dragons, and they just cannot do it. Trelly, they push us the four, but the ferrymen cannot find their footing here. It's going to be the dragons taking third seed out of this tournament. All right, I may have said that Lazar was the MVP, but I might have to give Dardes valuable mention because that was a tr that was a Terra wall from Dardes that just stopped Sino from running away there. He ulted into Terra, and I was like, that's interesting. Why is he ulting into a roar? Doesn't matter. He ends up just stopping the Ragnarok in its tracks, still using the ultimate to help his team out, and then makes the, the, the clutch play to make sure Paul goes down as well. It seemed like Nika had it covered, but hey, you get two more kills towards the end. I, I don't know. That was a, a hype moment. Very rare that you see a Guardian transformation come in that clutch towards a Fire Giant fight.
And sometimes it's, it's that simple. And that simple is making really complex plays and complex <laughs> calls really deep in the other team's jungle. I, again, they were just waiting. They, they kept fishing. And eventually they got the bite that they wanted to. Yep. It's a really good separation from the dragons, opens up the door, and then the floodgates. You just can't stop the flow that is thrown their way. And, and more specifically, Charlie, one of the things we've been really worried about and, and stressed about with this Dragons team has been sieges. And I think this set, at least when they've been winning, when they are the team sieging, yep. they looked incredibly good. Definitely a good look for them as we go into Masters. And the last look we'll have of them before we see them at Masters. It's 3-1 for the Dragons, and that's it for me and Charlie. We'll throw it back to the desk, and they can break it down. Yeah, that's all right. It's the last time that we'll see both of these teams up until at least the Masters event in just a couple of weeks out there. But the Jade Dragons ending off on a strong foot for themselves, a 3-1 win over the Six Ferrymen. And the Ferrymen were in control of a lot of this game. Up on the older game, a few thousand gold up. And then the Jade Dragons, one little bait around the Fire Giant, nets them four kills, able to grab that Fire Giant after, and then complete momentum shift here in game number four. Yeah, it looked to me like Lasbrook got some items, and that's where the shift happened, right? It just absolutely dominates the carries. Of the six ferrymen in this one, I believe it was a double kill on both carries to grab themselves the fire giant. That fire giant, of course, doesn't get a whole lot done because Mike pulled in by Fenrir ult, which I suppose was the reason Fenrir was locked in. The, the two team fights that I saw the six ferrymen convincingly win were off the back of Sino pulling in either Nika the first time around Pyromancer or Mike around his own Phoenix and saying, "Let's just, just, just kill him, kill him before he's out of my mouth. Get, get, get him right now," and it worked out. Otherwise. We had come into this game expecting it to be a Jade Dragons victory just by composition alone. I don't think I saw a single double Vamana play this entire game. I'm not even certain that Nika had ever even hit Paul this game. Simply doesn't matter when Lazarus playing at the level that he is. So uh, the trend may continue. What we have noticed in the league as a whole is game one, you lose to Vamana. Game two, we're never doing that again. This time... You won't lose the Vamana again because the set's over, fortunately, for the Jade Dragons uh, and for the Six Ferryman, I suppose, if you just don't want to deal with that once more. Clean play to the Jade Dragons. A very impressive set. Big adaptations from what we had seen even just yesterday. I like it a lot. The, the decision-making is a lot cleaner. It seems like when someone makes a call, everyone's sticking to it. And if that's the case, be it right or wrong, a team that plays together tends to win together. Who would have ever guessed that one of the most clutch Terra plays of a set comes from a Morgan transformation into a Terra. Come late game there. Dardos with a nice little highlight play, as mentioned there, by the end of the cast, stopping the Ragnarok in its place and setting up the snowball for the Jade Dragons in that final team fight, getting that pick onto Sino and then be able to continue running that one down through there. 3 0 7 for Dardos, 6 2 and 4 for Lasbra as well. Strong performance out of both of the players of the Jade Dragons. And again, in a, in a game that started off a little bit unfavorable for them, able to recollect themselves, group themselves up around that fire giant, wait for that perfect opportunity, and then Lazarus making that highlight real play, going in, eliminating Cyclone Spin, and then immediately taking Paul out afterwards in that 2v, well, two 1v1 situations for him there, and able to really turn things around for the Jade Dragons and find themselves a big win to close out Masters. Who better to talk from the Jade Dragons than PBM himself? He's standing by for our post-game interview. That's right, I got PBM, and first and foremost, you win. I just kind of want to know what does this mean, I think, for you guys, not just going towards Masters, but like in general with the way things have been going this phase to get the win here. Yeah, honestly, my I was really excited for this tournament, not even because of like, mostly just to have three best of fives to play with Dardevs finally yeah. here is so good for us. Like, actually get the feel in the studio. He's a big part of our comms, how we want to play. So, yeah, it felt fun. And I saw it, the excitement at the end. <laughs> you stood up. He you know, fists to the air. I keep asking Kabam, I'm like, why do they want me for the interview? And he's like, it's because you keep yelling. I'm like, yeah, I'm trolling. I'm saying, like, finally, you guys can play the game, you know? Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm roasting them. It's not a real pop-off. And that's, uh, that's how you know it's the true team dynamic, right? Yeah. And if you aren't feeling comfortable enough to roast them after the game, then yeah. are you really learning? Are you really course, winning? No. Uh, I do have to ask, game three, couple of stumbles, right? The Ferrymen play really well, I think, yeah. in game four as well. But what is it that goes wrong in game three in your eyes? Uh, I think we were in a pretty good spot. I think we had a Gold Fury where maybe we, we lost two kills. I, I had bad yeah. comms there. I tried to, I saw like all three carries in front of me and I had a Terra 2 and I called like I thought I could wall them. And I like, I like split the uprights. Like 
I didn't stun Cyclone, who was in front of it, and I barely placed it not far enough back on the wall to actually like block them, so yeah. there was a gap. So it was just a bad fight, and I like baited them with comms. And sometimes it's all it takes, right? It happens, and yeah. I think it is important, though, you know, when we've been watching it, especially because there's been conversation around this tournament, uh, you know, a lot of the guys on the other side were what, five and five uh, in their standings coming yeah. into it. You guys definitely didn't have, I think, the win loss. The that sandbag you division, for sure. Yeah, and yeah. so being able to come in, find, I think, crucial wins, but more importantly, to be able to win over some of the other teams that have been beating you this year, how important has that felt morale wise? I mean, I always believe that we can beat everybody. I mean, it was a bad phase, no doubt yeah. about it. But, like, even our first set against the Warriors, we, like, beat them in game one in, like, 20 minutes. Game two, we were ahead the whole game. And then I just dropped an absolute stinker on Kepri in the mid-game, just got picked a ton. So, like, we always know it's there. We're just, like, a couple steps away. Uh, even, like, the progress of the weekend, I think we didn't yeah. play great against the Hounds, but what, much cleaner today, so I'm happy. Like you said, you get three best of fives to, to kind of practice, and while it's in a tournament setting, you get a win. You find yourselves in third seed, which is a pretty fantastic spot to be in. It's a 3-1 victory. Congratulations again on it. Thanks for your time, man. And we'll go back to the Mike, desk. play Guardians. Play Guardians. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. He's, he's Wait, talking to me. Was it you or was it me? I can't tell. We're both, we both have the glasses. Yeah, I was. I don't <laughs> snort, okay? I beg. Mike, please play <laughs> Guardians, man. You didn't play the Afro Hell. It worked. All right? That's all I'm going to say. The J Dragons do find themselves a nice win, secure themselves third seed out of the master, out of the playoffs event and now moving in at least towards Masters. So a nice strong suit for the J Dragons to end on here in their playoff matchups. But we still have one more set to go. Their J Dragons, their path. A loss to start out the weekend to the Eldritch Hounds 3-1. Then a win up against the Gilded Gladiators 3-1 just yesterday. And then now closing it out with a 3-1 over the Styx Ferryman. But we still have one more set to go. And this one's on the winner's side of the bracket. Atlantis Leviathans and the Camelot Kings to face off. The Kings found themselves a 3-1 over the Hounds for their first and so far only matchup of this weekend. Is for the Leviathans a 3-0 over the Gilded Gladiators to get them to their path there. And now we will get to see which of those two teams comes out on top. So they can secure themselves first seed moving into the Masters division. Yeah, I'm excited for this set, J-Mag. I mean, they are chomping at the bit out there, trying to get into these booths, ready to play. Uh, I don't think there were any bigger Jades Dragons fans for that set than the Camelot Kings of the Leviathans themselves, just waiting for their opportunity to get out there and battle it out. The Leviathans, of course, maybe not the performance they would have liked to have had throughout the regular phase. I think the same could be said of the Camelot Kings, so redemption tour for the both of them. Yeah, both these two teams hungry to try and find a win to close out the playoffs and give themselves a nice little spot moving in towards Masters. Remember, that's going to be taking place in just a couple of weeks. So a very important set for both of these two teams, the Atlanta Leviathans and the Camelot Kings set, coming up right after this break. I promised I would wait for you, but I'm getting so impatient. Tell me that you're ready now. This room is big enough for two. And I wanna do that something, something that will blow your mind. Do you know the things you do to me? Touch me and I'll make you understand. Yeah. Do you know the things you make me feel? I can show you if you take my hand. I just wanna dance, dance, dance with you. Let me take you under when nobody can see. I just wanna dance, dance, dance with you. 